So again, thanks all of you guys for joining us today. Um, we are here to learn about the Nebraska bumblebee atlas, um, some details about bumblebees, their ecology, the different species in Nebraska, and of course, how to participate in the atlas. Um, if you are a past participant, there's a, a couple of changes that have happened between last year's uh, data collection process and this year, so we'll be sure to update you on that. And let's get going here. So my name is Katie Lamke. I'm going to be the main project coordinator for the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. If you have any questions throughout the season, um, feel free to reach out to me. I am a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society, and I'm based in Lincoln, Nebraska. And today with us, we also have Doug Golick and Rich Hatfield, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves here. Doug, if you want to go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to have you here today as a part of the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. Um, my name is Doug Golick, and I'm a professor, associate professor of entomology at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. In the um, and I've been involved off and on for about 20 years in doing work with bumblebees and a lot with projects that are citizen science based projects like the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, where we try to get community scientists like yourself uh, engaged in working and in, in, in with bumblebees and, and in the state of Nebraska in particular, we have a long history of records on bumblebees in the states and we've had I think this is probably the fourth project over the years. Uh, that has investigated bumblebees at different intervals. So I don't know if we're unique, but we're, I think it, we're pretty special in that uh, there's records from the early te 19 teens on some of the first surveys in the state, all the way up to very recently. And so we're excited to have you all as a part of the project in looking as our habitat changes, looking at how those species has changed across the state, uh, especially due to agricultural use. And now as we face climate change uh, and, and variance in temperatures and landscapes. So, Thank you uh, for being here today, and we've got a lot to cover, so I'll just uh, be quiet at the moment. Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerces Society. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, um, and I direct our bumblebee conservation programs. And right now, a lot of that means running these bumblebee atlas projects. We have them running in six states right now, in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, California, Missouri, and Nebraska, and we're hoping to launch into more states um, relatively soon. Um, so I'm mostly here today just in a support role. Um, I supervise Katie, but I'm here today mostly just to answer your questions. So I'll be the person in, in the background responding to your questions and, and I'll be sharing links in the chat and I may pop in occasionally to answer some questions audi audibly, but mostly I'll just be in the background. Thanks so much for being here today and uh, look forward to a great session here. Thanks. All right, and then we also have two other staff on the ground here in Nebraska that I wanna mention. They sort of work on the project uh, on the back end. They are very knowledgeable on putting pollinator habitat in the ground, different species you can use, different man management tactics. So that's Ray Powers and Jennifer Hopwood. They're also connected with the Atlas project. And of course, we wish we could all be out at an event like this, swinging nets, learning how to catch bumblebees and photograph them in person. Um, but thank you for joining us on Zoom and spending a lovely sunny Saturday sitting on the computer for a few hours. Um, so the plan for today, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a lot of information that's coming at you, but hopefully it will all be useful and helpful information. Um, we're going to start off with an introduction to pollinators, and then we're going to dive into bumblebee diversity, ecology, look at their value as pollinators, and then we're going to look at their conservation status, so how bumblebees are doing, what threats are affecting them, um, and what sort of actions we can take to support them. And then I'll give you a brief overview of the atlas, and we'll plan on taking a pretty good sized break there, maybe 20 minutes or so. So you can have some time to yourself um, and feel free to ask questions in the chat during any of these sessions and Rich can answer them. We can also take some time to exchange answers verbally um, after each of the sessions. 
So when we get back from the break, Doug is gonna go over the different species that you can find in Nebraska, how to identify them, where you might find them. And then lastly, we're gonna go over the protocol for the Atlas. So how do you actually sign up for this project? How do you conduct a survey? How do you handle bumblebees when they're right in front of you? So with that, um, we're gonna jump right in here. First, tackling the Xerces Society. Um, a lot of people kind of- Hey, Katie, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> you want to just give a, do you want to just give a quick Zoom tutorial here and let folks that may not have used Zoom before know where the chat and the question and answer are um, oh, so they yeah. can use those? Just, just a quick orientation for some folks that may need it. Yeah, so down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box and a chat box. Feel free to use either of those. Um, it will be easier for us if you use the Q&A box because we can see which questions you're asking. Um, some people might have the same question and you can upvote those so that we know more people want to know the answer to this question. Um, and then the answers to those will stay in the box. So feel free to use question and answer and chat, but preferably question and answer. Okay, good to go. So the Xerces Society, um, it's named after the first butterfly that was known to go extinct from man. So it's named after the Xerces Blue Butterfly. And the organization is a nonprofit science-based organization that's based out of Portland, Oregon, but we have staff in about 50 different states now um, that work on muscle conservation, um, putting in pollinator habitat, working with landowners and farmers, um, getting some research done on different organisms. And the reason that we choose to work with invertebrates is because they play a very large role in the way that our ecosystem functions, right? They're helping out with decomposition. They're helping out with biocontrol. They are the base of the food chain. They help with pollination and water filtration. And so if we think about what the world would be like without invertebrates, it would be very, very different from what we know it as today. So I mentioned this just a second ago, but the way that we work is through conservation, right? We have people on the ground putting in habitat. Um, we advocate, we work with towns and cities um, and colleges to adopt more pollinator friendly policies. Um, we're doing direct research, finding out what bumblebees and mussels are in different areas, how they're doing. And we provide education, whether that's in the form of these courses or putting out books or fact sheets to help um, educate people on what they can do to help pollinators. And the greatest thing about the Xerces Society is that it is donor funded. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit. So if you would like to become a member and help support the work that we're doing, you can log on to xerces.org slash donate. And we would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so pollinators. First, we're gonna start at square one with what is pollination? Um, there's a couple types of pollination. There's self-pollination and cross-pollination. And when we're talking about pollinators, we're usually talking about plants that require cross-pollination, which is when an animal, it's usually an insect, is visiting a flower, they're collecting pollen grains, fly over to another flower and they'll deposit those pollen grains on to the flower. And this fertilizes the plant, which allows it to reproduce and create seeds, which is when we get things like nuts and berries and all the tasty food that we like to eat. And we can see the effects of pollination in many different ways in our natural areas. And one of those is maintaining diverse plant communities. So as the plants are allowed to grow and reproduce, they keep the ecosystem stable, right? They're helping with nutrient cycling in the soil. They help with soil stability. They help filter water. The plants themselves can sequester carbon. And you can see just how deep some of these roots go underground in the prairie where goldenrods, that's a common one that people know, can get down to about seven feet underground, which is very impressive. And then with the above ground side of things, nuts and berries are providing the food for lots of different wildlife and nesting areas for these species to um, reside. 
And we can consider pollinators to be an ecological keystone, right? Because they're helping maintain diverse plant communities, which is helping stabilize the wildlife populations. Um, the ecosystem just wouldn't be the same without pollinators helping to maintain that. And more than 85% of the flowering plants on earth require a pollinator to reproduce. So Xerces had the opportunity here to partner with Whole Foods and remove everything in the grocery store that needs a pollinator. So here's what our typical produce section would look like. And if we remove everything that's pollinated, it would look a little something like this, right? Many of you might have seen these photos already, but it's quite a drastic change. We still have some good options there, but a lot of the tasty choices and the nutritional value disappears when our pollinators disappear. And not only do they have um, an impact on our nutritional values, but also on the economy, right? So 35% of crops worldwide require pollination. And you can see the figures there that it's a pretty large value, right? 18 to $27 billion estimated from pollination just in the United States. But who are the pollinators, right? It's more than just bees. There's also moths that can contribute, beetles, flies, butterflies, wasps, there's all different kinds. But the most effective pollinator and why we hear about bees so much is because they can do this job better than any other pollinator. And that's because bees are the only insect to consume nectar and pollen as both larvae and adults. So it's their only source of food, right, is to visit flowers and collect that nectar and pollen. And as such, they've adapted these really interesting structures that allow them to collect and transport mass amounts of pollen. So if you look at this bee's hind leg here, she's got a whole bunch of really dense hairs that sort of act as a brush that we call scopy. And the bee is able to pack her hind leg full of pollen and transport a large amount of food back to her nest. And some other bees like bumblebees, instead of having that dense brush, they have what's called a corbicula or a pollen basket where it's more of a hollowed out groove on her hind leg that she can pack full of pollen and fly back. So this photo here is a bumblebee that's got a huge amount of pollen caked onto her back leg. And the last thing that makes pollinators really effective at um, transporting and delivering pollen to other flowers is that they exhibit flower constancy. So as a bee leaves their nest to go collect pollen, they're generally gonna visit the same type of flower on that trip. And this ensures cross-pollination, right? So if a bee leaves the nest and out in the field they see there's roses, there's daisies, there's violets. The bee is gonna choose to visit the daisy, fly to another daisy, fly to another daisy and back to her nest. And this drops off the appropriate pollen at the appropriate flower, right? Because the rose pollen can't use the daisy pollen and the bees have sort of figured out this system that's beneficial for both of them. But when a lot of us think of bees, most of us are thinking of honeybees, right? Because they are an object of familiarity. We've all heard about the declines happening with them. They're very important to our agricultural system, but they're not the most, uh, they're, not, they're not the bees that you're gonna find out in the natural areas. And so just out of curiosity, we're gonna launch a poll here to see how many different species of wild bees you think there are in the United States? So just take a second there and answer the question of how many different types of bees you think there are in the United States. Ooh, it looks pretty close here. Lots of people are voting between 500,000 and 2,000 and 4,000. So the right answer is 2,000 to 4,000. So there are actually, let me get back to my slide here, about 3,600 different kinds of wild bees in the United States. And amongst those wild bees, there is a lot of diversity 
um, between size and color. Um, their lifestyle, so some of them are social, but most of our solitary, most of our bees are solitary. And in Nebraska, it's estimated that there's about 300 to 400 different bees. And that's not a solid number, but that's, that's an estimate of what people think are in the state. So when we look at wild bees, they can be very, let's see if my slide wants to advance here, very, very tiny, right? So this is a bee right up next to a dime that's pretty small. So most of you, if you saw this bee, you probably wouldn't think it's a bee, right? It's not black and yellow. It's not making a large buzzing noise. Um, bees are also diverse in the ways that they nest. So here we have a leaf cutter bee. And if anyone has seen those bee blocks or bee hotels out on the landscape, these are the types of bees that you might find nesting in there. So this leaf cutter bee is going and cutting a whole bunch of small pieces of leaf. She'll fly them back individually and create little chambers in there that she lays her nest on. So the top row that we see there, let me see if I can use a pointer. This one's from a leaf cutter bee. And then we have a mason bee down here using wood, or I'm sorry, not wood, mud. And then in the middle, we have a resin bee. So the different bees are gonna nest in different places and they're also gonna utilize different materials. We also have um, carpenter bees. So we have large carpenter bees and small carpenter bees. So the large carpenter bees will actually bore into wooden structures and create their nest. Um, small carpenter bees will bore into pithy stems of like a rose stem or a blackberry stem. Um, big blue stem is a popular one for them out here. And the majority of our bees actually nest in the ground. So we have some that nest socially in the ground and they'll build large tunnels. We also have some that nest solitary um, in the ground. So there's no queens, no workers, no colony. It's just one female bee who builds her nest down there. Another diversity aspect in bees is their diet. So we have some that will forage on pretty much anything that's available to them. And then we have some bees that are more particular and they're only gonna eat pollen from a certain type of plant or closely related plants. So that's kind of why it's important to keep a diversity of plants out on your landscape so that you can provide food for as many different species as possible. And here, I just wanna show a couple of photos of bees that really emphasize their beauty. So this is a small carpenter bee here, if you've ever seen one of those um, crawling into a stem nest. Um, this is what it might look like up close. They can be blue, they can be green, really deep hues, not a lot of hair on them. We also have sweat bees. A lot of people are familiar with those. Um, these are usually a deep green metallic color and all the little pink spots that you see on her hind leg are pollen grains. And then lastly, what we're going to focus on today, oh, the slide froze, hold on, anticipation, are the bumblebees. So this is a huge male bumblebee here um, showing all of his beautiful yellow hairs. And so these are the pollinators when we are looking at our natural places that we need to be thinking about. It's not the honeybees that are out here maintaining our natural ecosystems. It's all the native bees, right? Those maybe 300 to 400 different bees in Nebraska. So before we move into bumblebees, are there any questions about general pollinator diversity? There are no open questions and no hands questions. raised or anything. So I think we're good unless someone wants to chime in, which is which is great. Go ahead and raise a hand if you want to speak or you can type things into the chat or into the question and answer. Okay. Well, I guess we'll move on to bumblebees. So we're going to have another poll here. Instead of bumblebee, uh, I'm sorry, instead of wild bee diversity, how many different species of bumblebees do you think there are in the United States? 
If you read the workshop description, you might have seen that there's 20 in Nebraska. So that means there's probably a little more in the United States. All right, well, most people guessed 50 to 60, and while I wish that were the case, um, there are actually about 47 different kinds of bumblebees in the United States. And when we look at where bumblebees are the most diverse, it's typically seen in the Western coastal and montane regions here. So all the little spots that you see on the map that are red, that is where you can find the most different species of bumblebees. And in Nebraska, if you're familiar with birds or you look at different types of plants, you know, there are some that you only find in Western Nebraska and there are some you only find in Eastern Nebraska because we are sort of right in the center of North America, right? There's species with an Eastern range and species with a Western range. And that's the same for bumblebees. And if you look at the map here, you can see that Western Nebraska, that Northwest corner is red, right? Meaning there's a lot more species in that part of the state than there are in Eastern Nebraska. And looking at the colony overview of bumblebees, they are social. So that means they have a queen, they have workers, and they produce males that all sort of live together in a nest. Bumblebees have an annual life cycle, meaning they're active on the landscape during one season. In Nebraska, that peak season is June through September. And the colonies are founded each year by a queen. So in April to about right now is when we see the peak of queens emerging. And um, they start a new colony each year. And a colony, depending on the different species and the amount of resources available, can have anywhere from between 25 to upwards of 500 workers present. And the bumblebees like to nest in sort of these messy areas, right? They nest in pre-existing cavities on the landscape. So that can be old rodent burrows, it can be in bunch grasses, unmowed areas, sometimes bird boxes. They really like to get into um, open siding that has some insulation, that's a great place for them to nest. Maybe not the greatest for us to manage, but they find their way in there. And so when we look at bumblebees throughout the season, if we start um, here, this is where we are in the spring. This is about maybe the last three weeks or so in Nebraska to right now, the queens are emerging. All winter they've been hibernating underground. And as they come out, they're gonna spend a couple of weeks looking for a proper nest site, right? So it's only the queen bumblebees on the landscape at this point. When she finds a nest site, she's gonna collect some nectar and pollen, start laying her eggs, build up these waxen pots to hold the food in. And then as the first batch of workers emerge, they're gonna start taking over the foraging, right? So in between spring and summer here, we're gonna see a lot more workers on the landscape that are taking care of the foraging, they're maintaining the nest, and the queen is gonna stay in the nest for the rest of the season, simply focusing on laying eggs. Towards the end of the season is when males and new queens are produced. So males and new queens come out towards the end, they'll mate, and then at that point is when we see the new queen die off, the old workers will die off, I'm sorry, that the old queen dies off, the workers will die off and the males will die off. So the only um, member of the colony who survives through the winter will be the newly mated queen. And then she, again, in the following spring will start this life cycle all over. So this is called an annual life cycle and it's what bumblebees go through. In addition to, let me stop the laser here. In addition to the social colonies, there are also a parasitic um, bumblebees that we call cuckoo bumblebees. So if you've heard of cuckoo birds, there are also cuckoo bees. And cuckoo bumblebees emerge a little bit later than the queens, right? They're coming in 
at a very precise time in the life cycle where they want to infiltrate the nest when there's enough workers that are produced, but not so many that they'll kill the cuckoo bee. So the cuckoo is coming in to, to kill the queen and then lay her own eggs. But the workers that are already in that nest are going to help raise the cuckoo eggs. So these bees look a little bit different than your regular bumblebees. They have a little bit harder exoskeleton to be um, tougher at fighting and trying to kill that queen off. And they generally don't have as much hair. So when we look a little bit closer at the spring, um, queens, again, they're gonna spend about two to three weeks looking for a suitable nest site. And there's a lot of uncertainty here in this part of the life cycle because it's not common that we come across bumblebee nests and it's certainly not common that we come across a queen looking for a nest. So the preferences as to where queens are looking for nests, what habitat features they're seeking out, if it's something about the soil, um, if it's something about the surrounding landscape, we're not exactly sure. We have an idea of where they like to nest, um, but whether they choose to nest above ground or below ground, all of them tend to look for an area that has um, some insulation in it already, right? It's a pre-existing cavity. So they're not looking to build their own nest or dig their own nest. They want somewhere that's already on the landscape, like an old mouse nest. Um, and then within the nest, the bumblebees grow through, um, they start as an egg and they're gonna be laid on a mixture of pollen and nectar inside the nest. And once they're in the larva stage, that's when they're gonna start consuming that pollen, right? The pollen and the nectar is gonna help them grow. In this stage, the worker bees and the queen are tending to those larvae, making sure that they have enough food, making sure that there's not parasites sort of floating around. And then they're gonna spend a little bit of time pupating, right? Which is when they're transforming from that grubby looking phase into an adult bee. And once they emerge as adults, that's when they start taking on roles and when we see them flying around, right? They're out foraging, they're collecting nectar and pollen or they're attending to the nest. And then in the fall, towards the end of the peak colony season is when the males and new queens come out to mate. Um, here we have a picture of a queen bee, who is the larger one, mating with a male. And the male's role is pretty minimal in some senses, right? They, they leave the nest and they don't generally return. They don't have a foraging role. They don't help rear any of the brood their real responsibility is just to mate. And um, it's, it's quite important when you think about it because you need that genetic diversity, right? You need those different males out to avoid inbreeding, right? That's it's not helpful for any organisms. And then when everybody else has died off at this point in the life cycle and all we're left with is that newly mated queen is when she finds a place to overwinter. And just like we don't know a lot about nesting, um, we also don't know a lot about the overwintering stage because it's very hard to come across these bees. Um, but what we do know of them is that they're generally looking for a place to overwinter that's on a northern sloped area, under trees, under leaf litter, sometimes in rotten wood, or in areas of bare ground. And in 2019, a project was launched called Queen Quest to help us learn more about overwintering queens. Um, and so people go out in the fall or early winter um, and see if they can find bumblebee queens. Like, we want to know how deep do queens go? Um, what habitat features are they looking for? Does it have to do with the soil? Is it something with the pH? And so sometimes people just come across bees like while they're gardening. Um, and so we're asking people that if you come across a bee that you can submit photos and a couple of habitat features to help us learn more about bumblebees, right? Because the more that we know about this stage of the life cycle, the better we can support them and conserve them because this life cycle of overwintering is very essential, right? If the queen doesn't survive 
through the winter, that means there's no colony that's going to be produced the following year. And it's amazing that we don't know very much about this stage, considering that it's about half of the life cycle when you think that they overwinter from October through April or so. Like that's a large chunk of time. So the more we can learn about this, um, this phase, the much better we'll be able to support bumblebees. All right, let's, let's look at some of the questions here before we dive into the values. Yeah, there's a couple of good questions, Katie. Um, okay. One of them, the first question that popped up um, <clears throat> is, oh, what happened to it? There was a question about the diversity slide that you put up with with Nebraska, and someone was wondering how certain we are in that, or is it just a lack of sampling? Um, and I thought that was a good question that should be addressed live. Yeah, I think um, it's a little bit of both. We are pretty certain in the number of species. Of course, sometimes some will split and some will merge, but where they are, I'd say the center of the range is pretty firm, right? But we're seeing some shifts. Some species are spreading, some species their range is declining. And so the, the range and the distribution of particular species is definitely a little bit, it's shifting. But I think the majority of it is, um, we've got a good foundation, I'll say that. We have a good foundation, but I think there is more to learn. And certainly in some areas like Western Nebraska, there is a lack of sampling. And in states like North Dakota and South Dakota, there's a lack of sampling. So we have an idea of where species could be, but there's not enough data to say with certainty that we know they exist here at this time period. Yeah, I, th I think I agree anything? with all that. I, the only thing I would add, I think, is just that sort of that general map. I think we under, we've done enough sampling to understand sort of where North American bee diversity is. So I think that map as a whole is probably pretty accurate, but where individual species are is uncertain. And I think that is why we're launching these Atlas projects to a large part is, I mean, as Doug mentioned at the beginning, Nebraska is unique in that there have been a number of these um, sort of atlasing efforts throughout history in Nebraska, which is fantastic. So we have a pretty good idea there. Um, although it's really important to keep tabs on things and how these things are changing through time, which is what Katie was talking about with climate change and a lot of other factors that are, you know, altering how bumblebees thrive on the landscape, I think um, makes these projects really, really important. Uh, and then Katie, there's a couple other questions about the life cycle here. Um, one is, uh, does the overwintering queen hibernate or is she active? Does she have any wax pots in there with her? Or is that only spring summer nests where, when there's brood? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the queens are hibernating. They're not active during that time, but they will spend the weeks leading up to their hibernation period foraging, right, and gaining those energy reserves to help them make it through the winter. Do cuckoo bumbles have corbicula? Cuckoo bumblebees do not have corbicula because they are not out collecting pollen, right? They're basically stealing a nest and having other workers do everything for them. So all they're doing is laying eggs in a, in a nest. And we'll actually look at some pictures of that in the ID section with Doug. Um, and then a question just about sort of the casts within the, the colony, within the nests. Where, where do the workers come from that tend to the larvae if the queen is the only one who's there laying eggs? Yeah, so that's, that's a seasonal thing, right? So the queen will start the nest each year and she's gonna take on the role of everything. In the beginning, the queen is the one who is foraging. She's building the nest. She's getting the food for the waxing pots. She's laying the eggs. She's tending to those workers until there have been enough workers that have emerged as adults to help her with those roles. 
So it's just at what point in the season you're looking at the nest of who is doing what. But in the springtime, it's going to be the queen doing everything until enough workers are in the colony. Uh, another question just popped up here. How, okay. Do we know how much the spring planting chemical application affects emerging queens? Do we know for certain? No, but <laughs> does it likely affect them? Yes, very much so. Yeah, I think this is an interesting piece here and something that I think we need to work on as a society is that a lot of the chemicals that we're using, they're tested uh, on their impacts on insects, um, especially beneficial insects like bees, but the majority of um, the testing that happens happens with honeybees. And so this is a route of exposure that honeybees don't have, right? Honeybees live in, in hives that are often in trees or they are in largely in boxes that are moved around by people. And so they can be removed from an area before spraying. Um, but our, as you, as you are alluding to here, you know, the queens are just in the ground. So any, any chemical spraying that's coming is going to have an effect, you know, directly on their bodies as well as moving through the water table um, in the ground. And I don't think we well, I don't think we understand well, you know, the effects that this is having on emerging queens or on early founding nests or in a number of other factors, largely because these chemicals just aren't tested on native bees, um, particularly bumblebees. So uh, this is a, an area where we need to evolve and probably um, increase the, the complexity of the testing that we're doing to make sure we're not affecting beneficial insects like bumblebees. I think we, we got them all. Oh, one more just popped up. What is the time between the laying of eggs and the emergence of adult workers? About a couple of weeks. You may proceed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're going to look at the value of bumblebees. So they are pretty interesting pollinators uh, for a few different reasons, um, which is from their physiology, their intelligence, their tongue lengths, uh, and their innovation. So something I didn't talk about with wild bee diversity in that beginning set is that our bees have a lot of different size tongue lengths. And one of the ways that we classify them is by short tongues and long tongues. And so bumblebees fall into the long tongue category. And looking at their physiology, um, bumblebees are a relatively large species of bee and they've got a lot of hair on them. And because of their large size, they're able to sort of induce shivering and heat up their body temperature. And this allows them to fly at cooler and wetter temperatures than you might see a lot of your other native bees out foraging in. Um, and the next thing is their tongue length, right? So bumblebees being long tongues, they're going to be able to access a wider variety of flowers because they can reach all the way back into what we call floral spurs, right? So some plants on the landscape have these really deep um, petals on them that hold the nectar that pollinators have to be able to access if they're gonna pollinate it. So these bees can use their long tongue and reach all the way back into the plant to grab that reward. And some of their tongue lengths can be between six and 18 millimeters long. So if you look right here, this is a bumblebee tongue. And these bumblebees are reaching their tongue all the way back into these plants here. The next feature about bumblebees is their innovation. So because of their size and their ability to um, induce shivering, they can do what's called buzz pollination, which is when they essentially disconnect their wing movements from their muscles and are able to vibrate the flower so vigorously that they dislodge pollen grains. So some plants like um, tomatoes and peppers, blueberries, cranberries, pitcher plants, 
they'll hold their pollen very, very tightly um, within their structures. And they need a pollinator like a bumblebee to come and vibrate them so hard that it releases the pollen grains. So something like a honeybee isn't able to pollinate these plants. And here we have a gif. You can see the bumblebee buzz pollinating. So right here, this is all pollen coming out thanks to her vibrations that she's providing. And bumblebees are also very strong, right? Again, with their size, they're able to pry open plants like the bottle gentian and crawl inside to provide pollination services. So a lot of our smaller pollinators, you know, they might be able to squeeze in if they're tiny, but otherwise you need a strong pollinator who's able to open up that flower and access the reward. The last thing is their intelligence. Um, there's been a really cool project where researchers were able to show that bumblebees have the ability to learn and then um, teach their nest mates how to access rewards. So we'll see if this video here plays in the next slide. Okay, here it is. So what they're doing right now is they're training the bumblebee. So they're saying, hey, if you move this yellow ball to the center of the ring here, we'll give you a nice nectar reward. So they're showing the bee how to move the ball to the center once it gets in the right spot. And nectar comes out and the bee notices. And she's like, oh yeah, look at that. There's delicious nectar in there. It seems to be going a little bit slower. Sorry if it's taking a while. All right, so after the training, then the bumblebee shows that she has learned, right? She says, if I move the ball to the center of the ring here, I should get a nectar reward. So she's taking the ball, moving it to the right spot, and then she got the reward. So then they can actually figure out the most efficient way to, oh, Sorry guys, I don't know what's happening here. The bumblebees can figure out the most of, oh no, it's not working. I'll just explain it in person. The bumblebees are able to figure out the most efficient way. So they showed the bumblebee three different balls that were spaced at different distances from the nectar reward ring. And the bumblebee chose the one that was closest to the ring and moved it to the center, thinking that if she moves this faster, then she'll get the reward. And then in the next part of that video, they had two bumblebees where one had not been exposed to the ring before. And the bee that was trained showed the other bumblebee how to move the ball and get the nest or get the nectar reward. So it's it's pretty impressive thinking about these bumblebees and you know, this is only the beginning of what we understand about their intelligence. Um, so we'll see if there's any more questions here. Katie, there is one participant, um, Dinah Robinson, who has her their hand raised. And I'm um, I'm not sure, so I'm gonna let them speak and see okay. see what happens here. So I'm gonna press this allow to talk button, and oh, she put her hand down. <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> okay. All there right. Was one one observation about nectar robbing, um, Katie. I don't know if you want to talk briefly about that, but someone witnessed a uh, bumblebee piercing 
the bases of fall flax flowers. Um, oh, yeah. And I just talked a little bit about nectarolling, which is a neat phenomena. Okay. Yeah. And nectar I'm also, sorry, I'm, I'm also going to paste the link to that YouTube video um, on Bumblebee Cognition if you wanted to see it. I'm going to put that in the chat. Yeah, it is a really interesting video. It's unfortunate that it's not playing here. Um, but nectar robbing is something I see a lot of it um, with penstemons out here. And it's when a bee, instead of flying into the flower and pollinating it, they'll actually fly on top of it and go near the base of the flower. So where it's attached to the stem and they'll pierce a hole through the petal and just sort of steal the nectar. So it's called nectar robbing because they're not actually providing pollination sources or resources, but they're just, they're stealing nectar. It's efficient for them, maybe not the greatest for the plant, but if you ever get to experience it out in the field, it's, it's pretty interesting to watch. Carpenter bees are also notorious for doing that. Okay, well, with no other questions, we're gonna move into bumblebee status, threats, and decline. So this is gonna be um, a information intensive section here. There's gonna be information on the threats, but we're also going to go over conservation action. So everyone that is interested in what plants you can plant for pollinators, that will be in this section. So make sure you got your notebook ready. Um, so bumblebees in decline. Um, researchers were alluded to decline beginning with these four species right here, at least in North America. And these are our sister species, meaning they're very closely related within the bumblebee group. And they used to be some of the most common species found throughout their range. And then dramatically, they just became very hard to find. And so people were like, what's going on? What are the factors that's um, causing this, this rapid decline here? And so the Bumblebee Specialist Group, which is a group within the International Union of Conservation of Nature, came together. Um, it's about 75 different bumblebee experts and specialists from across the world. They came up with a standard assessment that they could use to look at the different bumblebees and see how they're doing. Um, like what's, what's affecting them? How, how stable are they? How unstable are they? Are there threats that are leading to the decline? And what they found, at least in North America, is that 25% of our bumblebees are in decline, meaning they are in a threatened or a near threatened category. And then there are some that are data deficient. So like somebody asked earlier, is there a lack of sampling? And yes, for some species, there's just not enough information for us to know if they are in decline or if they've just always been in low abundance. And so looking a little bit closer in the central United States, there are nine species that are listed um, in a risk category. So there are critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. And if you look at the scale here, you can see that after critically endangered comes extinct in the wild. So some of these bees are pretty far along according to the assessment that was carried out. And in Nebraska, we have four of these species, Bombus sucleae, um, Bombus variabilis, Bombus fraternus, and Bombus occidentalis, which is the one that's pictured here. And these four species are listed as species of greatest conservation need by the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So that means that the commission is aware that these four species exist or existed at one point in the state and are in need of priority. You know, when they're designing conservation efforts, these species are at the top of the list. But when it comes to figuring out what is causing the decline in bumblebees, it's very hard to tease out, right? There's so many different factors coming from so many different angles. It could be genetic diversity that's causing decline. It could be pesticide exposure. It could be lack of foraging resources or contaminated foraging resources. And another way to look at this um, is the interaction of them. So not only 
Could it be pesticide exposure killing the bees? But it could be the interaction of pesticide and habitat loss that's affecting the bees. Or maybe a bee is exposed to a fungicide that is already dealing with um, a certain pathogen. There are many different factors that are leading bee decline, right? There's, it's not just one. There's a whole bunch of different threats that bees are facing and trying to tease out which one is dominant is nearly impossible. But we're gonna talk about the top ones. So these are not in an order of the biggest threat. These are just the top threats. Um, and so with each of these categories, managed pollinators, pesticides, habitat loss, climate change and an uncertain future, we're gonna go over the main threats and what the problem and issue is. And then we're also gonna talk about some conservation actions and what we can each do to sort of mitigate the threat. So the first one, looking at managed pollinators. Commercial bumblebees are a thing, if you have not heard of them. Um, a lot of commercial greenhouses that grow tomatoes or peppers have adapted to using commercial bumblebees because of their ability to buzz pollinate, right? So the crop that the farmer is growing produces better fruit from bumblebees because bumblebees are able to buzz pollinate. Honeybees can't carry that out for them. So because there's been a market for this, lab-reared bumblebees have, have come up, right? And you can ship bumblebees from one part of the country to another. And when you do that, you're putting a species that is native to one area into an area where it's not native. So what you're in doing is introducing um, possible diseases and parasites and pathogens that these native species haven't been exposed to before and might not have the antibodies to fight off any disease that's transferred here. You're also possibly introducing competition, right? If these bumblebees that are native to this one area, non-native here, are going to be competing for resources and nesting resources um, with the native bumblebees. And currently there's only regulations on commercial bumblebees in California and Oregon. Um, the next thing to talk about is honeybees. And it's very, very keen to understand that beekeeping is not bee conservation, right? There are many great reasons for keeping bees. They are very supportive of our current agricultural system. It's a really great hobby. They're great um, for education and getting up close with the species, but they're not the way that you should go if you wanna conserve bees, right? Getting um, honeybees to conserve wild bees is sort of like raising chickens to conserve grassland birds. They're just not comparable. Um, if you are looking to get into beekeeping, the University of Nebraska has a great program for this called Great Plains Master Beekeeping. Um, and they'll teach you everything you need to know about that. But it's, it's very important to understand that keeping honeybees is not, is not the way to save the bees, as people like to think. So the next one we're going to talk about is pesticides. And pesticides can um, infiltrate bees in a variety of ways, as we see here. So it can be direct contact. It can be through contaminated nest materials. Um, it could be indirect contact. So if the pesticide is on the plant and then the bee goes to forage on that plant, it's collecting nectar and pollen that has pesticide residue in it. It can be contaminated nest materials. So if some of that pesticide runs off and gets into the water or the soil and then the bees are nesting in that soil, they're gonna be exposed that way. Um, and it can also happen through systemic contact and pesticides that are long lived in the soil. So one of those is imidacloprid, which is a common insecticide used in the agricultural industry. And you can see it's increased use um, from 94 to 2012. And the way since systemic insecticides work is they're taken up through the roots and then expressed in the rest of the plant. So 
the roots drink up this systemic and pesticide. It is shown in the leaves, it's shown in the petals and the nectar and the pollen. And then a bee comes to forage on this plant and is picking up small amounts of that pesticide. And with enough of that um, pollen and nectar gathered that's contaminated, they're being exposed to sublethal doses, right? So if they eat enough of that, it's going to affect them. And these systemic insecticides can live um, in the plant and in the soils for months to sometimes years. But it's not just the agricultural industry, right? We also see pesticide used a lot in our urban spaces. So here's just a typical parking lot um, that Rich, Rich had to deal with this situation that was out in Wilsonville, Oregon in 2013. And it's a parking lot filled with a bunch of linden trees and they were spraying them with a insecticide because there was a bunch of dew drops coming down and landing on people's cars. And it wasn't aesthetically pleasing, it was sticky on the hoods. And so the business was like, okay, well, we'll spray them and get rid of the aphids. And not only did they get rid of the aphids, but if we zoom in here, they essentially um, got rid of all the insects that were on those trees, including about 50,000 bumblebees. So that was the largest mass pesticide poisoning of bumblebees that has ever been documented. And it also killed off honeybees, lady beetles, anything that was an insect in that tree probably didn't survive that day. And it was all because we didn't want aphid droppings on our cars. So pesticide damage like this is not usual, right? Because we don't usually see it in these numbers, but it happens all the time. It just goes unnoticed. And so some of the things that we can do is be more aware. Like when we go to nurseries and select plants that we want, ask those nurseries if their plants are treated. A lot of the big box stores carry plants that have neonics or other insecticides already in them to give them a better shelf life or make them look prettier or whatever we're doing to keep the plants looking good for the consumer. A lot of them have insecticides. So then when you take that plant home, put it in your garden, you're also putting in those neonicotinoids. So one of the things that Xerxes came out with this year was a webinar and a fact sheet that helps you learn how to buy bee safe plants, um, how you can talk to different nurseries and start to change that supply and demand chain, right? If we are going to the stores and asking like, hey, do you have plants that aren't treated with neonicotinoids that are pollinator friendly? You know, that's gonna start to bring that shift. And a lot of times you'll go to these stores and the employer won't, won't even know. They wouldn't have thought about it if it wasn't asked. So us bringing it to their attention is, is an important factor in starting to bring the shift. Another thing we can do is just rethink what constitutes damage, right? So in a lot of our, our gardens and our yards, we like things pretty and we like things neat. But when you think about nature, that's, that's not how it is, right? Nature is messy and it is wild and that's what makes it neat and pretty, right? It's not these human manicured spaces. And so learn to accept some imperfections in your garden and leave things more wild. Because if you came across this, some people might just grab a pesticide and spray it because there's obviously a problem and sometimes spraying it is the easiest thing to do. But if you investigate what's causing this, you might come to find that that's actually a leaf cutter bee and you're supplying habitat for pollinators. So just take a second and notice what's happening in your yard before assuming that it's negative. Some other things that we can do are use an integrated pest management strategy. So invite those beneficial insects into your yard, right? Invite those spiders, invite the wasps, um, and allow them to help take some of that control and maintenance over. If you use native plants, a lot of these are water wise, right? They don't need a lot of fertilization and watering because they are adapted to this area and they have ecological relationships in place already with different species. And if you have to imply um, insecticides, only try and do it when the pest population 
is hindering the health of the plant. So in this photo here, you can see that there are some aphids under that flower, but is it causing a problem? No. And um, again, if you have to apply them, try not to spray while they're in bloom, right? Don't cause direct contact. Don't bring about indirect contact if a bee comes in a couple of hours after you've sprayed. And try and target only the plants that have the pest issue. Don't do preventative maintenance with pesticides, right? It's not useful in the long run to put pesticides out into the environment that aren't necessary. And use selective products, right? So choose things that aren't gonna persist in the environment for a long time. And then of course, read the label and apply them under ideal weather conditions. So don't spray them before it's gonna rain and have all that pesticide just run off. Um, don't spray them in the wind when they're just gonna drift away. And the next thing we can do is just educate ourselves more. I am not a pesticide expert. I still have plenty to learn about this, but Xerces has a really amazing pesticide program where we put out webinars and different fact sheets to help people start to understand this complex issue. Um, and I see a couple of questions. So let's look at those before we move into habitat loss. Yeah, there's just one question about um, wind turbines. Interesting question about how the vibration that these um, may cause through the ground and, and prairies may affect bumblebees through sort of tactile and audible um, effects. And I, I don't know the answer to it. It's a good question. I don't know if either of you have thoughts. Yeah, I don't, I've not thought about that before. That's a great question. I would think probably not as much as some other factors, obviously, um, but yeah. You hear some of the, I don't know, Rich and, and Katie, you hear some, maybe some of the folks uh, heard stories, people drumming for bumblebees. Have you ever heard that, Rich? People like taking a jug and then putting a bumblebee in there or actually vibrating the top of the jug and getting bumblebees to come into it. And so as attracted to the sound. Uh, and so I don't know how true those are, but I used to hear a lot of those stories from the uh, quote unquote old timers, um, but they have, have had a sensitivity to those sort of vibrations on the ground. So I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. I've heard of people using dogs to try and find bumblebee nests, but not, not drumming. Katie, there's another question about, um, is there data on the quantities of pesticides used in homes and cities versus agricultural use? Um, I would say likely, but I'm not exactly sure on that. Rich, do you know? Uh, well, I mean, I don't, I don't really know because we actually don't have data on it. Um, we only collect data on quantities used in agricultural lands. Um, but if we, if we look at sort of monetary so where where these pesticide companies are selling their products we have data on that and um in in terms of herbicides herbicides are vastly used um, by agricultural um so much more money is spent on herbicides in agricultural lands than they are in insecticides and it's flipped um so with insecticides most of the money is actually coming from um, the, 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 the private market. So a lot of these are likely used um, in cities and, and suburban areas um, in lawns and things like that. So um, they're certainly equal, if not more. And, and, and in terms of quantities, we don't really know because those data are not collected or at least not reported um, in any systematic way that we can track it across the country. The only data that we do have are people can go into streams and actually test um, stream water for concentrations of these insecticides and other pesticides. And in many cases, concentrations in urban and suburban areas is in, in waterways is greater than it is in agricultural areas. Um, and so there are probably a couple of reasons for this, one being that um, 
I, you know, farmers have an economic incentive to use as little product as is effective um, and they're trained. Whereas these same products with the same concentrations, sometimes even greater concentrations are available at, you know, commercial box stores that you can buy. And most homeowners aren't, aren't trained in these things and, and often feel that more is better. Um, so it's likely that a lot of these are over sprayed. And, and I know that a lot of sort of lawn maintenance and other companies like that um, sometimes do, you know, can apply these things annually. And some of these chemicals um, are long lived, especially in trees. Um, they can, you know, after a single application, they can be detected up to five years after a single application. But if you're, you know, just continuing to apply these, um, they can build up in the environment and, and get into the water table and into our streams. So that's the, that's what I know anyway. And then there's another question about having a bee house and worrying that wasps will nest in there. Um, that is a possibility, but I don't think you should be worried about it. So just like there are solitary bees, there are solitary wasps. And if you have those beneficial insects in your yard, in your garden, they're going to help maintain smaller pest populations. So I think if you're providing a home to solitary bees, um, you're doing a good thing. The other thing that people either aren't aware of or forget with the bee houses is that they do require maintenance. So they need cleaning. Um, if you leave out the bee house for a couple of seasons, it's likely that it's going to attract pathogens and parasites. And if bees nest in there, they're going to contract those. Or you just might not have bees nesting in there. So if you can try and clean out your nest after the bees or the wasps have emerged in the spring, whether that's a power washer or you get a brand new nest and put it up there, um, but make sure you're switching it out and keeping it clean. There's another question here about neem oil. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, Katie or Doug? I know a little bit about it, but not a ton. I don't know enough about it to speak on it. Okay. Um, my understanding with neem oil, it's an insecticide that can be used. It's applied to plants um, and it's mostly for herbivores of plants. So things that would be actually eating um, the plant itself would be, animal, would be things that are affected by it. My understanding is it's got pretty low toxicity for non-invertebrates, but um, but the animal would need to be eating it. So it's unlikely to affect bumblebees who are not actually eating plant material, but are rather drinking nectar and eating pollen. Although if it got into the pollen and nectar, it could affect them. Um, but it would affect, you know, some of our native um, important beneficial insects like, um, you know, caterpillars and a lot of our other plant feeders that, you know, go through their life cycle by eating plants. So, um, so that would be the, what I know about neem oil. I don't know more. I think you're dead on, Rich. Uh, aphid control and those kind of things. If you're using like in your garden, that's where a lot of people want to use it, like a vegetable garden. Um, obviously, when you're not going to be eating the vegetables, you know, before um, as a plant's growing, developing for blooms. And um, I would never spray it on uh, blossoms or anything. So, but it's an okay product, um, especially for vegetable gardens and things just early. Okay, we'll move on to the next threat, which is habitat loss. So habitat loss, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of our natural areas that are converted into agricultural landscapes or urban landscapes, whether that's um, pavement or lawns, areas that are not very supportive or habitable for not only pollinators, but wildlife in general. Um, particularly in the Midwest, um, there's a lot of agriculture out here, right? We have very fertile soils. We have a relatively flat landscape. It's a very inviting environment for agriculture and the success of um, harvest on farms. And so what we have here, these are two different maps. The one on the left is the net 
cropland increase between 2008 and 2012. So where you're seeing spots of yellow and red on the map is where um, land is being converted into cropland. And then on the right, where it's the blue and yellow map, is from a different study that was looking at bee abundance. So in areas of yellow are where you're seeing bee decline. And if we kind of look at the two different maps side by side, areas where we're seeing an increase in cropland is also where we're seeing a decrease in bee abundance. And looking one step closer, these were from areas that were converted from grassland into uh, cropland. So 77% of land that was converted from grassland into cropland is showing on the figure on the left. And then on the right, where they saw the bee abundance decrease, 60% of those areas is where grassland was converted into cropland. So we know that there is habitat loss that is contributing to bee decline, right? There's strict overlap, especially here in the Midwest. But again, just with pesticides, it's not only the agricultural industry, right? It's also urbanization and these habits that we have as humans to put in huge lawns and put in lots of pavement and parking lots, um, we're expanding and we need to expand the space, but we can do so in a way that's more supportive of pollinators. So one way to do that is by thinking about pollinator conservation across landscapes, right? It doesn't have to be turn your yard into a messy prairie. It can be putting out a few pots um, it can be along roadsides, it can be in front of businesses, parking lots, um, even restoring some of our natural areas that have maybe lost some of their floral diversity and making sure that these habitats are connected because having connected habitat really maintains um, bee diversity. And if you aren't able to directly put down habitat, one of the ways that you can help is by supporting your local conservation spaces or organizations who are carrying out this work. And so here's what it looks like when we all start to put out little yards and gardens and places for pollinators, right? It's not just a pavement desert anymore for them, but they have little patches that they can fly to that either offer nesting resources or food resources. Um, and looking specifically at a single garden, these are very important spaces in urban areas, right? Small spaces can offer uh, food resources and nesting resources for a wide diversity of pollinators. And there was a study that showed that um, a flower strip that was planted one year later, it attracted one third of the species, and this was done in Germany. So the city's um, bees, a third of those that they know about were found in this area. And so it's just kind of one of those examples where it's if uh, you plant it, they'll come kind of thing, right? It's not about getting honeybees and saving the bees physically, but more so about providing them with foraging and nesting resources so that they can survive. And another thing that we want to talk about is lawns, right? These manicured lawns that often require a lot of water, a lot of maintenance, a lot of weed control. They're also not supporting very much diversity, whether that's in plants or insects or birds. Um, so here there's a diagram that shows if you have lawn, then you're feeding the seed eaters and the not, I'm sorry, the leaf eaters, right? Things that can eat grass will be in your lawn. And then the things that can eat the grass eaters will also be there, but there's not very many, right? Lawns aren't very supportive of diversity, but if you introduce even a few amount of species, right? This one is with 10 to 30 different plant species present in a yard. And you can see that you're inviting a much more diverse web of organisms and supplying that uh, habitat, right? Because now you have the insects that eat the leaves, the pollen and nectar, and the seeds. And when you introduce um, different plants, it becomes easier to maintain because these species are often water-wise, right? They don't need that fertilization. They don't need the 
large amounts of water, they don't need as much maintenance, and you're going to have biocontrol happening. So it becomes a lot easier on your end to maintain your garden with the more native species you have. And we don't all have to go for this yard and landscape, um, the garden yard, which some of us might aspire to, but to others, you know, this isn't the case. So you can still have a lawn that you can put some pollinator habitat in little islands or around the edges of it, or just have a few pots in the area. And when it comes to flowering plant selections, um, you really wanna focus on prioritizing those native plants, right? Because they already have the ecological relationships from this area, right? The insects are used to feeding on these plants. Those birds that eat the insects are already used to it. So you're just providing habitat for species that already exist in the area. And you can achieve multiple conservation goals, right? Less water, not a whole bunch of mowing for these. And those roots that we showed earlier are gonna help stabilize your yard a little bit better. And when you go to pick out plants, um, along with talking to nurseries about the pesticides that are coming in the plants, you want to avoid double petaled varieties. So a lot of plants that you can find nowadays have been modified to look beautiful, but they don't offer very much nectar or pollen. And therefore you're, you're putting in something pretty, but it doesn't have a functional use to it, right? The bees can't access anything from it because there's nothing there. And again, with your plant selection, to support bees throughout the spring, summer, and fall, you want to make sure that your bloom times are overlapping. So you want to sort of plan your garden, make sure you have blooms in the spring, make sure you have blooms in the summer, and make sure you have blooms in the fall to support not only the bees, but all the other pollinators and beneficial insects that need to eat during the summer. So in Nebraska, some of the um, Early bloomers include a lot of the trees and shrubs, right? Those are usually the first things that we see to come to bloom, like the redwoods, um, dogwoods, gooseberries. Gooseberries are very popular with bumblebees here. Um, if you're in the Lincoln area, Wilderness Park has a lot of gooseberries with a lot of queens on it. Um, and then we have some more spring bloomers, a um, little bit lower to the ground, not the trees and shrubs, doesn't have to be giant. Wild onion, pasque flower, milkweed, milk vetch, poppy mallow, indigos. Indigos, I feel like whenever I come across an indigo in the field, there's a bumblebee flying nearby somewhere. And that's an interesting one to watch too, because that that flower requires the strength to pollinate it because they have a lip on it. So the weight of the bumblebee pushes down on the lip, which allows the bee to access the nectar and pollen. Uh, Penstemons are also a good spring bloomer here. And then as we move into summer, there's a lot of options. Uh, this is definitely not all of the options, but here's a, a few that Ray Powers put together, our, our habitat person on the ground here. Um, hyssops, milkweeds, tall thistles. A lot of people tend to think that thistles are a weed. Um, I can't, I think Nebraska has maybe five to seven species of native thistles. Um, they do exist, native thistles are a real thing. They are very, very beneficial to native pollinators. Bumblebees love them. There are some bees that are specialists on thistle. Um, so if you can change your mindset from thinking thistle is a weed to it's a, a beautiful source of food for pollinators, that would be pretty beneficial for us all. Um, bergamot, that's a really good one. Compass plant, iron weeds. So there's lots of different options to introduce color and structure into your garden. Uh, fall favorites, we've got liatris or gay feathers, pitcher sage, the bottom yellow flower here is wing stem. That's a popular one with bumblebees. Um, sunflowers. And then there's also some shade tolerant plants too, right? Snake root, wild onion, columbine, bellflower, Figworts, 
And this way you can you can mix it up. I feel like a lot of people like to put in the classic hostas in their shade tolerant garden, but there are quite a few other options if you go out with intention looking for them that can also provide some support to pollinators. Um, there are certain bumblebees that you can find near wooded areas, wooded edges. Um, certain species like the woody, woody areas rather than the open prairies. And here's a list of local plant resources. So Nebraska actually has a Native Seed and Plant Producers Association. And if you go on that website, you can find links to all of these different nurseries where you can get local seeds, local plants, um, resources, guidance. Um, they're very, very helpful if you need assistance on how to get something to germinate or what sort of watering needs to happen. These are your people to go to and you get to support local. Um, Xerces also has a Northern Plains plant list. So if you didn't get to scribble down all the plants we just went over, you can look up this sheet here and it's got a pretty extensive list of plants to use throughout the summer and the fall and in the spring. And in addition to providing foraging, um, providing nesting habitat is also essential. So bumblebees, like we've talked about earlier, they like those messy areas. They like uh, blackberry brambles. They like to nest, nest under bunch grasses, rock piles, unmown areas. Sometimes they'll nest in bird houses. Sometimes they'll nest in um, insulation here. Like you see this picture that says, be very careful that was in somebody's sighting. Um, and again, like we don't know all there is to know about bumblebee nesting, but there are um, sites, Bumblebee Watch, you can upload photos of a bumblebee nest if you come across one. And it asks you to enter in some information about where was the nest, what kind of habitat was it in, um, how many bees did you see? And this sort of builds a database for us to better understand what bumblebees um, need when they're nesting or what areas they're preferably using. Another thing you can do in the fall is to leave the leaves. So this is a campaign to sort of leave your yard a little bit messy and natural in the fall. When all those leaves fall, there's no need to sweep them up and put them into the trash, right? That act, the leaf bed acts as a wonderful source of insulation for many different types of invertebrates that are going to overwinter, right? They need that, um, they need that protection from the winter elements. So there's butterflies, um, caterpillars, beetles, flies, bees, the queen bees. Um, most of them are going to be overwintering in vegetation or in the ground. So if you can pile up your leaves like on your vegetable bed or around the border of your house or your garden, keeping that little area of habitat is gonna be very beneficial. Um, and this is similar to the last one, but overwintering sites. So if it's possible for you to leave your dead vegetation standing until the last frost the following year, right? So about like three weeks ago or so, because there's gonna be insects that are overwintering either directly in those stems or underneath them, that area is habitat for them, right? So if you cut it down and throw it away, those insects are going with it, right? You're gonna have less insects the following year. So maintaining um, overwintering areas is also an essential part in helping pollinators. Okay, any questions on habitat? Will the plant resources overlap with the Kansas Flint Hills? Um, we have a different section. Uh, Kansas is not in the Northern Plains. I can get that link though and we can put it in the chat unless Rich is. I'm working on it actually. You're working on it, okay. Yeah, we have a different plant list that will work for Kansas. Hey Doug, I don't know if you're around uh, still, but there was a question about um, different 
potentials for using repellents that are that won't affect um, beneficial insects. And I made a comment and, and answered it uh, in the question and answer section. I typed an answer. But I also think that probably UNL Extension and Master Gardeners would be a good resource for finding solutions like this. And I don't know if you want to um, share more about that. I'm sure you know more about that than I do. And I, and I thought it just might be a good opportunity for you to, to let folks know about those services. Yeah, I would, you know, certainly, uh, you know, if those are familiar with Backyard Gardener, I think it'd be an awesome question uh, for those folks on that program, Kim Todd and others. I'd love to see that question on there. Um, and also, uh, yes, the uh, uh, brass extension horticulture. Uh, there's a couple of really good folks there. Um, Mary Jane Froge is one uh, that does a lot of work with uh, garden plants and pollinators, a little bit of work. And so there's some resources I think available there. Uh, but like a lot of things, I think we need to be careful. And as Katie mentioned, this idea of, you know, by practicing IPM, but also avoidance in time of, of things like spraying. So these avoidance uh, chemicals that are that can be put on uh, plants to keep pollinators off of them. Um, I, I don't know how well they work. I know there's a few options out there, um, and I something I've not really done any work with. So I, I don't know. I, I know there's some larger scale things people have done, um, but a lot of it. A lot. It's better a lot of times just to avoid spraying uh, during those times and keeping things off. Uh, your flowers. So if you're thinking larger crop scale, I don't know anybody that's doing that here in Nebraska, uh, spraying uh, plants to have things not go into them. Uh, I don't know if Katie or Rich, if you're aware of anything else for a larger scale. Master gardeners, you might have a little more trouble with, I guess. No, they may not know that knowledge. Yeah, I think one of the things to, and I typed this in the answer, but I think one of the things that people, that we all need to think about more is you know, if you're having some pest, especially in a garden at, at your home, if, if there's a pest in there that's, that's creating damage significantly, right, that's a system that something is out of whack in your garden, right, and something's missing, like there's some part of the natural ecosystem that's missing, you don't have a, a component that's attracting the natural, like wasp or something else that might help you control that pest. And so I think thinking of your garden as a system um, that we need to sort of play with, right? And that's one of the fun parts about gardening is like what, what components missing? Maybe this plant is not in the right place. Maybe I need to move it. I think all of those things are where we should start before we start thinking about, you know, pro what's the product, what's the, what's the chemical solution to this problem? I think there's a ecological solution first. And I think we need to start there and play with our gardens and, and, and those fun ways to try to solve those problems, I think is the is the the best approach. Yeah, that's the scientist in you thinking for sure. What's what's the problem here, and how do we solve it? Well, a lot of times we recognize those things from neglect and not being out looking. And I know life is tough. That's one of the reasons why I don't do much vegetable gardening, gardening uh, because I'm not attentive enough uh, to those kind of things. And I think that's something you got to kind of always have. Your beat on, you know, kind of keep watching things as Rich said. Um, and, you know, a lot of gardens, it's great. You can pick things off of plants or soapy water if you've got aphids versus neem oil. I mean, that's another option for getting things like white flies and aphids off your plants. Um, so there's a lot of options before you go in there. I don't know if the question was regards to commercial or garden, but for most of us, we're talking about home and garden environment, which I appreciate Katie's discussion around that because that's what, what most of us are facing. Yeah. Yeah, but also the extension uh, services that we talked about for a second, they're very uh, knowledgeable people that have a lot of, they've got a good understanding of the pests in our area and have likely dealt with somebody who have had the same problem that you have and have a solution for you. So I wouldn't hesitate about reaching out to your local extension office to see what's going on and what you might be able to do about it. Yeah, there's a, another question that just popped up here about invertebrates and light pollution. And I think this same participant asked a question earlier about whether lights associated with wind turbines might affect bumblebee populations. And I, require, and I responded that I didn't think it would affect bumblebee populations. But certainly light pollution is a major effect of, of insect decline, largely for our, our night flying insects like 
uh, moths um, and uh, and a lot of animals like that that uh, you know navigate using the moon. Um, so and fireflies is another major exa example of animals that have been affected by light pollution. So certainly they are driving declines. Uh, I just don't think light nighttime light pollution is affecting bumblebee populations, but they're certainly affecting a lot of other invertebrate populations. Okay, so the last one we're going to look at is climate change and uh, an uncertain future of what's to come. Unless a question just popped up. Oh, that's Doug's. Okay, so bumblebees, they evolved in the nice, cool, Paleoarctic temperate climate, right? So they're fit for the cool climate. When we think about species diversity, a lot of us think about the tropics right away, right? Because there's a lot of different kinds of species that have evolved and adapted in that really hot climate. But bumblebees, their diversity is in the Western montane regions, right? They're not like a lot of our other species. And so researchers are expecting that with increasing temperatures, bumblebees are going to likely experience a range um, compression rather than expansion. Um, like a lot of our other species might be able to move upwards, but bumblebees are sort of at the top of their range already. So as they're forced north out of their southern range, they might not be able to move much more northward because they're already adapted to this climate. And this is not only going to um, affect the populations themselves, but also the plants that all bumblebees are out there pollinating in the natural ecosystem. So buzz pollinated plants, for example, you know, if the bumblebees are no longer in those southern latitudes, what's going to happen to them with the lack of bumblebees? Um, another factor in this is phenological mismatch or a mismatch of the emergence times, right? So if flowers bloom when there's a really nice day early in March, but the bumblebees or any pollinator for that matter haven't emerged yet, it's going to be a mismatch on pollination, right? The flowers aren't going to be pollinated because there's not a bee out. And vice versa, if the bees emerge on that really sunny day in March, but there's no flowers out yet, there's not going to have, um, there's no food resources for them. So this is something that might happen. It's not for certain, right? The, there is a chance that the flowers and the bees could sort of kind of go half and half with each other and make it but it's, it's hard to say what's gonna happen. So some of the things that we can help um, or some of the things that we can do to prepare for this uncertainty is really just put that foundation in place, make sure there's habitat on the ground, um, make sure there's food and nesting resources for pollinators and other wildlife. And one of these earth season initiatives surrounding this is the Bring Back the Pollinators Pledge. So you can go online and sign this and basically you're committing to grow a variety of bee friendly flowers that bloom from spring all the way to fall. You're gonna be providing nesting habitats, not only for bees, but also um, beneficial insects, caterpillars, fireflies, beetles. And you're gonna minimize pesticide use and share the word. So we have new pollinator habitat signs that were made this year that are available in English and Spanish and a very easy way to, you know, put this out in your yard and help spread the word and let people know what the importance of pollinators is, what a pollinator garden can look like. There's a lot of different kinds. So this is one of the avenues that you can take to support bees. Um, another initiative is Bee City and Bee Campus. So this is a little bit larger scale than just yourself, but it's when a whole city or a town or a village or a college comes in and says, we are gonna collectively create habitat for pollinators. We are going to reduce pesticides where we can, and we're going to hold outreach events and spread the word so that our community is aware of the importance in pollinators and what we all can do to support them and create habitat. And so, each bee city is 
overseen by a board of local community members, right? They're the ones that are driving this. They want to see the change. They want to have their town be supportive of pollinators. And so they come together, make this board, they decide how they're gonna handle the city, the campus and what it's gonna look like for their town. Um, in Nebraska, we have two affiliates. So there is Central Community College in Grand Island. They have a beautiful pollinator garden out there. They have lots of outreach events. They have a bee festival each year. I think it's in June. Um, and then this April, Bellevue, Nebraska became um, our state's first bee city. So more people can get involved with this if they choose to. Currently, there are two, a little over 200 different cities and colleges across the United States. Um, and then lastly is getting involved in community science. And these are projects that allow you to take a direct step towards pollinator conservation, right? If you don't have the ability to put down habitat, um, one of the ways that you can help is by participating in community science, right? You can go out, you can conduct surveys and bring that information back to help us learn more about bumblebees. And the more we understand about bumblebees, the better we can start to, you know, prepare for that uncertain future and we can refine our conservation actions to really make sure we're doing everything we can in the most efficient manner. So that's where the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas comes in, right? Um, it's a statewide community science project that's been going on. This is gonna be our third year now to track and conserve Nebraska's bumblebees, right? So there's volunteers from all over the state um, that go through a similar training like this they spread out, go do their surveys and come back and we start to build this, build this wonderful database. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about for the remainder of this workshop. But before we go into that, I just wanna see if there's any more questions about threats or conservation, um, anything in that area. Nothing new has popped up, Katie. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick, get the slide to advance here, just a quick um, overview of the Atlas, um, a little progress report on it, what we're hoping to do with the information that's gathered, and then we're going to break. So you're almost, you're almost at a break time if you can hold on for about 10 more minutes. So the Atlas is focusing on bumblebees for a couple of reasons, right? They are charismatic species. They're large, they're fuzzy, they make a huge buzz sound. Most of us can recognize them, you know, without having to think too hard about it. They're also a generalist species. So not only do they forage on a wide variety of plants, but they're found in a wide variety of habitats. So just as there are some birds that are specific to wetlands, there are bees that are specific to wetlands. But that's not the case with bumblebees. You can find them all over Nebraska and in a lot of different habitats. So the fact that they're in so many different places and foraging on so many different plants creates a lot of opportunity for people to go out and view them. And on top of that, Nebraska has a really impressive historical data set um, that will allow us to make some really nice comparisons and look at trends from the past to what we're seeing now. And when we look at that historical data set, um, all the gray dots that you see here are historical records, some of them dating back to the 1800s. Um, this bee here that's pictured is one that's preserved in the University of Nebraska State Museum. There's a whole big entomology collection over there. And this is one of the bumblebees that was collected in Lincoln in August of 18, it's either 92 or 93, 82. Can't quite see, but it's pretty impressive that there are species that go back that far and that there are records and observations that we can use to compare, right? So as we go out and collect data from today's time point, we can compare them to the past and see how they've changed. 
So the way the project is set up is that the state is divided into 78 near equal grid cells. And when you sign up for the project, you select a grid cell that you want to survey in. It can be one where you live. It can be one where maybe you're gonna go vacation there. It can be one, maybe you're gonna drive through that grid cell to another state. Wherever you adopt the grid cell, you're gonna go out and conduct surveys. So you're gonna run a bumblebee survey and a habitat survey, and then you submit that data. And as you submit the data, it sort of builds and builds and builds. And we have this wonderful data set of um, bumblebee observations and their habitat that we can use to improve the way that Nebraska conserves bumblebees. So to participate, you start by adopting our grid cell. And because this project has been running, this is gonna be the third year now, we've shifted the priorities. So in the last two years, we've had a lot of people conduct surveys in Eastern Nebraska. And so those grid cells, we don't really need information, but if that is the only place that you can survey, we certainly welcome you to conduct surveys there. But where we would like people to survey is in the dark blue areas and the light blue areas. And we'll go over what that means um, a little bit later when I go into the nitty gritty of how to conduct a survey. So after you've got your grid cell, you get familiar with the protocol, right? So that's gonna be what we do later today. You're gonna to learn how it is exactly that you swing a net. How do you catch a bee in a vial? How do you take photos of a bee? How do you fill out the data sheets? You get familiar with that process. And then you go out and survey for bumblebees. So our process is all catch and release, right? So no bees are harmed during this. Um, you put bees in little vials, whatever kind of container you have, and you put them on ice for a few minutes. And that essentially cools the bee down, thinks it's maybe time to hibernate. And this allows you to take really clear photos of a bee when it's not moving. And then when you're done photographing it, the bee will warm up and fly off. So after you've conducted your survey, um, you submit your data. And so throughout the season between June and September, as people are going out conducting surveys and submitting data, you start to see more and more observations come in. So all of these green dots were submissions that came in last year of where people went out and saw bumblebees. And the way that we collect data is through um, Bumblebee Watch. And this is a website that is kind of similar to iNaturalist. If you've used that, there's a mobile app and um, a desktop platform that collects bumblebees specifically. And this data set feeds right into the largest data set for bumblebees of North America. And so there's about 30,000 different people that are submitting observations. And what's really impressive is that in bumblebees of North America, right, the database that has everything about bumblebees in the US and Canada um, and Mexico, 25% of all of those observations have been contributed from community scientists using this website. That's a large chunk of observations and really amazing to think about. So before um, we go into the protocol session later, I just wanna ask how many of you have used Bumblebee Watch so far? So if we can launch the poll here, there it is. So if you've used Bumblebee Watch, whether that's the app or the website, maybe this is the first time you've heard of it, um, whatever it may be. All right, pretty, pretty equal split here. Got quite a few that have used it or at least plan to. Um, so all of these little dots come in as observations are submitted. And when we look at the map, from certain years. So in 2018, before the Atlas launched, um, you can see that there was some observations in Nebraska, but then in 2019, community scientists added over 600 observations to the state, right? And so that was a survey season of a month and a half. And then in 2020, we got even more observations, right? So in that year, 
almost 2,000 new observations of bumblebees came in. And so with these increases in bumblebees, right, we're now sitting at a database just from the atlas that's over 2,000 observations. Let me turn off my laser here. And so the ATLAS collects um, formal observations, which are part of a survey, as well as incidental observations. So these are ones where maybe you're not doing a survey, but you're on a dog walk and you see a bumblebee, you can take a picture and submit that. And then the, the purple check marks are habitat surveys. And so there's a quite a quite nice spread here of where people are conducting surveys and where they're conducting habitat assessments and all of that information allows us to start looking at the population shifts, right? How are the different species doing? Where are the different species found throughout the state? Um, what times are they active at, right? Do some of them come out earlier than another one? Um, what are the peak active periods? When do we see the most numbers of them? And we can compare all of these numbers to the past, right? We can look at those historical records. We can look at the huge chunk of observations that um, Doug did during his PhD in the early 2000s and sort of see how these species are shifting through time and make predictions for what might come in the future. Along with the habitat assessments, we can also um, take a better look at nesting resources um, so part of the habitat assessment is we ask you about some certain features, like whether you see pine needles or leaf litters, things that we associate with bumblebee nests right now. Um, and you say, yes, this is here. Yes, this is here. Or, no, this is not here. And we can sort of figure out correlations to what bumblebees are picking out in the landscape. We can do that same thing with management practices and habitat types, you know, our different species preferring different habitat types over one another? Or is it something at a certain time in the year that a management practice is affecting them? And then with all of this data, what we're planning to do with it is update a wonderful guide that Doug came out with in the early 2000s about the bumblebees of Nebraska. What species are here, where they're found, how to identify them, and add in that updated distribution map. Um, and then we're also planning on making management and restoration guidelines for those land managers um, or park managers that are looking to support bumblebees in Nebraska. Like what are some of the specific things they can do on the ground to support pollinators? And when we look at the progress of what we've observed so far, um, we've detected 11 species and it's estimated that Nebraska has about 20 and we're missing a few species that are typically only found in western Nebraska. So that's why the priority region for this sampling season is to get out west and see if some of these species exist here still. Um, one of the ones I wanna point out here particularly is the Southern Plains bumblebee. This is one of Nebraska's species of greatest conservation need. And that one you can see here represented 3% of all observations. And when we look at this species range map, um, the areas in orange are where it still resides and the areas in red are where it's starting to show its decline. And the green stars on the map are where, are the broad regions of where um, Atlas volunteers observed this bee in the last two years. And it's really, it's nice to see when the observations are made at the edge of a species range, because typically when a species is starting to decline, we'll see those um, declines happen at the edges of the range. So the fact that this bee is still found near the edge of its range is good news for us. The other exciting thing that happened with this species is that 13 new counties were added to its range um, in Nebraska this year. So just because there were Atlas volunteers out on the ground looking for bees, they observed this in 13 new counties that it has never been seen before in Nebraska. And you know, that just goes to show that sometimes it is a lack of data. When more people are out looking for bees and documenting them, it grows our understanding of them. So now, you know, we're gonna be able to 
manage for the species a little bit better because we know where it resides. We know what plants it's wanting to use. And the same with the habitat assessments, right? So we ask you about nesting resources. We ask you about management practices, the habitat types. And this is not an exhaustive habitat assessment. You know, they take maybe five to 10 minutes um, just to get a quick snapshot of what the area looks like that you're surveying in. And part of that habitat assessment is reporting on the plants in the area. And so here we have a list of the top, I think it's 13 plants that were reported um, in the habitat assessments that were visited by bumblebees. So on the, the left-hand side, let me get the pointer out. Here we have sunflower, and this is the percentage of total visits. So all of the bumblebee visits between 2019, I'm sorry, 2019 and 2020, almost 9% of those were made to sunflowers. So we can see the abundance of visits to each flower, but we can also see the diversity made to each flower. So on sunflower, five different species were observed on it, whereas something like a native thistle or a prairie clover had seven different species. So this is useful information when you're trying to figure out the best plants for how to accommodate um, diversity of species, as well as something that they like, right? There's a high abundance of bumblebees visiting this plant, but how many different species are visiting it? Like how many different kinds of bees are you providing food for? So with more um, data on this, we're gonna be able to sort of refine the plant lists that bumblebees need in different parts of Nebraska. And the last part about the Atlas project that we're gonna touch on now is that it's community science, right? It's a fun project. It's not just researchers going out, but it's people from the community that are exploring um, different parts of Nebraska and having a good time doing it. Um, we have an Instagram as well as a Facebook page for Atlas volunteers to connect on. So the Facebook is um, a closed group. So it's only for volunteers. They can talk about you know, where they're going to survey or post a picture of a bee or a plant they saw that they need help with. Um, and Instagram is really just used for sharing project updates or cool finds and sharing what other volunteers are using. So it's really great to do this pollinator conservation with other Nebraskans, other like-minded people and get to explore your state a little bit more. Okay. We've made it halfway through. Well, let's go ahead and get started. If others, I think pretty much everybody's back and got a little humor out of that, hopefully. Hey, Doug, before you do, I see that um, Kathleen Emery Mefford has her hand raised. Um, we could unmute them and see if they'd like to uh, ask a question here. Yeah. Kathleen, you have the ability to unmute yourself and ask a question if you'd like to. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Doug. Shh, shh, shh. They put their hand down. So uh, I think it was a mistake of some sort. Well, thank you for everybody that, that came back after the lunch hour. Um, we were kind of just bantering a little bit before to get you warmed up for this afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Golick and I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska um, and have for the last 20 years off and on done some work in Nebraska on bumblebees. Um, I'm, I'm a sub-partner with uh, Katie and Rich and the Xerces Society uh, for their great work. And Katie did an awesome job this morning. Um, and you get to hear a little bit more from her after I finish up. Uh, uh, kind of covering bumblebees and their biology and why, what their importance is to the ecosystems. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit that relevant to the project, to the bumblebees that are in Nebraska. We'll especially cover some diversity and range. Um, and also talk about uh, where they're found in Nebraska. So we'll, we'll, this is a subject that I could literally spend six or eight hours on. Uh, so I'm gonna try to do it in 45 minutes. But what I want you to walk away with today is we do have resources available like the worksheet that's put in this chat that will help you in the ID process. And I hope uh, along with what we're covering today that'll help you get started in this process. Um, so this is the outline here on the screen. We're gonna talk about the identification, how Bumblebees may be different from other similar insects uh, that you might get confused with them. 
uh, identify a bumblebee from uh, other bees and then Nebraska species. You know, uh, this chart represents kind of the mental steps, the process you need to go through. And a lot of us do this without thinking when you get to learn how to identify bumblebees from other insects. But this it's sort of a decision tree. And these are kind of good mental models to think about how you can go through and identify a bumblebee from something else. And the, the start here basically is to figure out whether it's even a bee or not. And there are a lot of insects that are very, very close in appearance to bees. Um, and then from that step, if it's a bumblebee, is it? or is it another type of bee? And then if you know it's a bumblebee, is it male or female or something else? And so we'll talk about that process today. Um, so I just, in my experience and in working with people on this subject for about 20 years, the two things people are gonna get confused or the one thing that people are most, most people are gonna get confused with a bumblebee is a fly. There are a lot of flies that mimic bees because it provides protection, even though the fly does not have a stinger, uh, it mimics uh, and, and it has evolved to mimic a bumblebee or other similar bee species uh, to offer it some sort of protection. And so uh, this, these two up here, the top one is a bumblebee, the bo bottom below is a type of flower fly, not super close in appearance, but if you're to each other, but if you were just to look at that bottom picture, not with the bumblebee aside it, you might easily confuse that with the bee. So in general, and, and, and for all bees and flies, all bees have four wings or two pairs of wings. So sometimes here it called two pairs of wings, a four winged and a high wing. And flies only ever have two wings. Um, and so that's something right away, if you look closely, um, you can notice that flies only ever have two wings, bees and other flying creatures, most others have, have four wings. What's confusing with bumblebees is the hind wing and fore wings can be attached to each other. They have the ability, like Velcro, to attach the fore and hind wing to provide more lift. So that isn't always super apparent with bumblebees that it has four wings, um, but that is a character that's true to all bumblebees and bees of the four wings and flies only ever have two. Uh, other characteristics are um, bumblebees and other bees carry a pollen load. Flies don't have the ability to carry pollen. Now, this is not a bumblebee in the top screen, but it does illustrate in the hind wing of this particular bee species, they have hairs all along. And that yellow uh, appearance there on the leg, it looks like a puffy bag of, I don't know, like fur. It's actually pollen that is attached to that hind leg. On the fly below, now, I love this picture that Katie's put in here. It looks like a bumblebee, but that is actually a fly. And you'll notice, as we get to looking at bumblebees more too, it does not have any pollen load on it. It might have a few specks here of pollen, but is not designed to carry that pollen load. So flies are not carrying pollen back and forth. Uh, bees uh, of different types do feed their young that pollen load. And so that's something you can look at right away. If it's carrying copious amounts of pollen, it's probably a, a, a bee. Flies, uh, unlike flies at the bottom right here, usually don't have a lot of hairs on them. There are some flies that have sparse hairs that are longer, that look almost like prickly, almost like a uh, a cactus, uh, but most flies do not have abundant hair throughout. Hair are structures that are designed for carrying pollen, but also keeping the insect warm. Um, and bees, on the other hand, usually have copious amounts of hair. There are a few species that have less, but most of those are the, you know, there's all kinds of different bees out there, and most of those are not heavy pollen carriers. But for the most part, flies are going to have very few hairs in their bodies. And if they are, they're very, very sparse. In comparison, bees have much longer antennae than flies. If you look at the top one here, this is a very typical uh, type of bee uh, antennae with multiple segments and quite long compared to a fly. They usually have these short aristi type uh, antennae that are very small and are shaped, in, most flies are shaped in this way with a small, a small hair on the end that's a part of the antennae and little stubs at the end. There are some, there's some diversity in flies, but for the most part, a lot of the flies you're gonna, gonna confused with bumblebees and similar bees have this style. And again, one other characteristic that once you get to looking at this a little bit, the eyes are different. And actually insects have two compound eyes and then these three simple eyes on top of the head. A lot of insects do like bees, but on your bee species, almost all of them have these eyes that are uh, you know, quite a bit smaller and on the side of their head. 
whereas your flies are have larger eyes and they meet together at the top of the head or the front of the head almost always. So that's one way they look quite a bit different, just look look a lot different. And the eyes take up a bigger portion of the proportion of the face than they do on bees and the flies. So just some general things to keep track of. Now, all of this sounds really easy until you actually get looking at some of these species and there's some very close mimics. So we'll take a look at some of those. I'm going to give you an exercise here and I want you to take a couple seconds. You can put it in the chat and we'll see for yourself how many of you are correct. In which of these photos presented on the screen, I believe there's only one, is actually the B. Oh, Katie's put a poll up there. Let's guess. Uh, go ahead and vote right now. So which one of these photo, eight photos below is the B? And there's only one of them. Not too many brave souls voting yet. Donna, I've seen you raised your hand here. We'll get to you a second. Give you a few more seconds. We'll try your hand at this. All right. Uh, we have a, a, probably our highest percentage as number six. And if you didn't get a chance to vote, just think in your head, we have one, two, et cetera. The actual answer is six, I believe. And Katie, correct me if I'm wrong. I had to look at this a couple of times. Uh, this, I love this picture that is chosen here. It doesn't really show the head and some of the characteristics we talked about, but just illustrates how confusing, if you don't look closely, that you can get between flies and bumblebees. These are all, all very close fly mimics. I would even argue number four that was pick, picked by a few mimics probably a particular spe species here that we have in Nebraska, Bombus fervidus or Bombus pensylvanicus, one of those two. Um, look at number one. Number one was also chosen quite a bit. That's actually a fly. It looks a lot like our Bombus bimaculatus or Bombus griseocolis that we have here in Nebraska. Some of these species can almost identically mimic the hair color patterns on bumblebees. So uh, it's really important that you pay close attention. And when Katie talks about the uh, little bit, the procedures for submitting photos, uh, we'll talk about how we verify these things and what to look for in those photos. Uh, there was a question uh, that was raised here. If I can figure out how to uh, raise it, maybe Rich, you can help me here. Uh, the question just about flies, is that, is that the question you're wondering here? There's a question, it says flies have only two eyes. There's a question, not a statement. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, they, they have two big comp compound eyes, as do bumblebees. I was just pointing out those celly are really simple eyes. And um, those, are, those three on the top of the head are a pattern of, of, of many of our bees. And especially apparent on things like bumblebees. You can see them real clearly on top of their head. Okay, um, hopefully I didn't skip too far ahead here. Wasps versus bees. The things you all, another group of insects you might confuse with bees are the wasps. And uh, one thing that makes them really confusing is they also have four wings or two pairs of wings. Um, the, but I think it's some ways easier to tell them apart than maybe some of the fly mimics because they usually have a very narrow waist that comes to a point. They don't typically have as many as abundant hairs. Uh, as things like bees, because they're, they're not designed for um, carrying pollen and other things like that. And they have, the, therefore they don't have a lot of pollen. You might see a few eating nectar and pollen on plants, but they don't bring it back to their nest in any large amount. And another thing that I really like that's on this picture here is this last box, which is on their exoskeleton, the actual outside, the armor, they have, you know, all insects have a skeleton on the outside of their body where, where we have ours on the inside their exoskeleton is colored um, in different patterns of color. So the actual skin or the exoskeleton is of a different color pattern. And bumblebees, for the most part, it's almost always black and the hairs are what, what is differing in color. So um, again, that's a way you can tell them from other bees and other insects. Okay, Katie pointed out at the beginning, we had uh, some of the sweat bees that had you know, green color. And you'll see some variation on different segments there, but for the most part, uh, that's restricted to things like wasps. So 
just something to keep keep track of as you think. And a lot of us are familiar with wasps because they're long, long, long and slender and that shape really shows up because they have no hair. So you'll have less confusion probably with, with wasps than you will things like flies that are close mimics. So once you figure out it's not a, or that is it's a bee and not something else, then you wanna think about whether it's a bee or a different species of bee or a bumblebee or a different species of bee. Honeybees is another very common um, bee that you're gonna see in a lot of flowers because there are a lot of beekeepers in Nebraska um, and you're gonna see them in different spots, especially attracted to flowers when you're, you're looking for bumblebees. Uh, they're, I think a lot easier to tell than, uh, from honeybees than a lot of the other things we're gonna look at today because they're smaller bodies, often a torpedo shaped abdomen. Uh, they have sort of a brown orange uh, color pattern with a little bit, a little bit of black um, and, sh and shorter hairs on the abdomen typically than what bumblebees have. Like the bumblebee, they do have a pollen basket or a corbicula on the hind leg. That's where they carry their pollens. Honeybees and bumblebees are fairly close related in, in terms of bees. They're pretty close together they're in the same group. Um, and you will see the pollen basket on the hind uh, leg of the, of the honeybee and bumblebee both. The other thing that uh, if you're really looking closely and get really good at macro photography and getting really close, you're gonna see that um, unlike bumblebees, honeybees have hairy eyes. And that's something you have to look real closely at. You're probably not gonna see, you know, if you're out far from a flower, far, far away from a flower. Um, but if you look real closely, they do have hairy eyes. Um, and a lot, all you have pretty much two races of bees in Nebraska, the carnelian and, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting the other one, uh, um, uh, Italian bees. Okay, we have Italian bees uh, here in the um, dark green box. And so they pretty much all look the same other than the drones, uh, which you may see out there too, a little fatter. But for the most part, you're not gonna wildly confuse those with bumblebees. The one that is, I think, real, real the two that are real similar parents uh, together is the, the carpenter bee and the bumblebee are the two that you might get confused. And rather than get too deep into this, um, you know, Carpenter bees have a very sparse abdomen as far as hair, hair goes. If you look at the top, uh, top box where you have the bumblebees across the top screen there, and at the bottom you have the carpenter bees, look at the abdomen. The abdomen is quite shiny in a carpenter bee. From a distance, they look very similar. They have a very similar buzzing sound. Uh, this time of year, they're probably burrowing into your deck if you have sort of an old deck or other, or other wood home. You're going to see those carpenter bees and think maybe at first they're bumblebees. Once you get to look close, closer, this large eastern bumblebee that's listed here, uh, or, hunt, or carpenter bee, excuse me, that's listed here, uh, is very different in terms of its uh, abdomen. And so that's probably the easiest way to tilt to the part. Again, if you look a little bit closer, you look at the hind legs are a little bit different. The bumblebee has that pollen basket, the smooth section on the, on the hind tibia, where it kind of collects that pollen and stores it. And then at the bottom, uh, they have the carpenter bee has hairy legs all up and down the legs. Again, they have a different biology and not to get too much into that, our bumblebees are nest uh, builders that have this disorganized nest. And then uh, carpenter bees don't, they aggregate, but they don't kind of live in the group for the most part. They'll be in the same spots uh, they don't share in uh, young, but they do nest in wood and create a hole there, burrow in and lay their eggs in individual cells that are stacked on top of each other in that too. So once you figure out what you got as a bumblebee, which has that hind corbicula, quite abundant and hairy, uh, makes a buzzing sound, has uh, the long and longer antennae, and has the yellow and black pattern for the most part here in Nebraska. We'll talk about some of the red or orange tail bumblebees that we have in Western Nebraska too. Um, you're confident that it's a bumblebee, you're pretty sure it is. Now you wanna determine whether it's a male or female. Um, Two big differences in male and females. Females, which you're gonna find, see most of the bumblebees out there and most of the year are gonna be females. That's, those, are, those are the queen and the workers are all female. A little bit later as the nest hits its peak, they'll produce reproductives, uh, queen, next year's queens and males. Um, so most of what you're gonna see throughout the year are the females. Um, the females can be differentiated between the males um, of the typical standard bumblebee. Females have the pollen carrying devices, the corbicula. They collect pollen and nectar and bring it back to the nest. They have 12 antennal, they have a, a small, shorter antennae, essentially less antennal segments than do the males. So their antennae are a little bit short, uh, shorter. And I will show you a, a picture that illustrates that at the very end of the talk. 
uh, to show you the, the differences in size, really. They're kind of easy to see once you see them. And um, typically, I, I think they look a little bit more groomed a little bit well. A lot of the male species have very wild hair uh, throughout the body. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of that at the end of the talk. But the key characteristics you're gonna look for is that hind pollen basket, probably the easy, easiest way to tell if it's a female bumblebee. The Xerces Society is, we're, in this project, Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, are mo mostly gonna be focused on uh, the male or female identification, less so on male, because a lot of those IDs are some variants in male species and how they look. Um, but if you do submit a male photo, it's no big deal, we'll, we'll count those as well. Again, if looking at the characteristics here, uh, female is well-groomed, has the pollen basket on the hind, uh, uh, hind leg, has a little bit shorter abdomen. The male has one additional segment. If you get to looking more closely and if, as you do this more, you can sometimes see that abdominal segment. Uh, the way you see that is the breaks in the hairs on the, uh, on the abdomen. When we get to looking at species here in a moment, look at uh, the female picture right there. You can see the breaks. Those are actually uh, breaks in the hairs. That's actually the uh, segments between the plates on its abdomen. They have turgites or little a piece of the exoskeleton that are separated and, and that are connected by more flexible exoskeleton pieces. And that's the break there is those interconnected plates that is listed that are shown there are actually what you're seeing. It's not, it's kind of a break just where the hair doesn't grow in those inner, inner segments as they're flexing. So uh, you can kind of see that there's different segments there. And as you look at the male, it's a little bit longer um, and a little harder to see than some of the other characteristics. Again, if you look at the hind tibia on the feet on the male, uh, it doesn't actually have a, a pollen basket or corbicula. Those are hairs throughout and quite shaggy, not as triangular shape as the uh, corbicula is on a female bumblebee. Again, 10, 10 antennal segments at the very end on females, 11, one additional one on what we call the flagellomeres, which are those longer, uh, smaller segments at the end of the uh, antennae. Um, some species of bumblebees have enlarged eyes. That's not the case for all the species. You look at a couple species, and I'll point those out here in a minute when we get to the different species, uh, are really pronounced. It almost looks like a fly eye in, in, in some cases. And finally, uh, which one I don't like to talk a lot about is a stinger, uh, because a lot of people are afraid of the stinger of bumblebees. And actually, uh, I don't know if Katie talked much about, you know, when, where you might get sting more than likely is around the nest. Uh, they don't have any defensive behaviors away from the nest most of the species. Um, and so it's the females that always have the stinger. That's a modified egg laying device in the females. And the males, uh, they don't have it because they don't lay eggs. So kind of cool there. Once you determine you have a bumblebee whether, and whether it's male or female, then you need to determine whether or not it's a true bumblebee or a cuckoo bumblebee. Some, some species of bumblebees are parasitic, which means they invade the nest of other of true bumblebee species. These are bumblebees, but they're, um, they're some species that actually only, as Katie said, uh, live off of the workers, the work that the work workers do in that nest. Um, very, pretty uncommon throughout the state of Nebraska and elsewhere. So if you find one, it's kind of a special treat. If you, if you ide identify one, they don't produce workers. They only produce reproductives to carry on that life cycle. One of the ways you can tell uh, is a cuckoo bumblebee from the true bumblebees is the abdomens have hair on the cuckoo bumblebees, but it's much more sparse. It's thicker, it just looks different in the abdomen, their abdomens do. They don't have a pollen basket because they're not pollen collectors. They don't produce any workers that are pollen collectors, just the next year's reproductives. Um, and, and they just look odd. And if you see bumblebee that looks odd, more than likely, or it could, it could be a, a cuckoo bumblebee. And, You'll know what I mean when you see one out in the field, they just look, don't look quite right. Um, and it's just kind of interesting. So, and they also have a little bit different, um, I'm gonna point this out on the very end here, a, on their last abdominal segment is much more scooped shaped um, than a pointed shape like you see on the other bumblebee stingers. Um, so there are other characteristics that uh, are there that are more morphological characteristics for, um, they have a, a hook stinger that can sting some of the other true bumblebees, kill the queen. Uh, and actually take over the nest as, a, as cuckoo birds do. Uh, and another picture right here I want to point out is the absence of a pollen basket on the right. We have a true bumblebee, probably a Bombus pensylvanicus maybe. I can't really tell, or oricomus it looks like. It has a, a pollen basket on the left. It does, the uh, cuckoo bee does not. All right, once it's a female and it's a normal or a true bumblebee, 
uh, then you can go to this identification guide. We actually, in the identification guide, do have the cuckoo bumblebees listed as well. So if you're looking at that, we'll get to those and they're in the uh, lower or right-hand side of the screen. These are Nebraska's bumblebees. Quite a bit of work in the last uh, you know, 110 years has been done on bumblebees in Nebraska. And so we have at one time or the other had 20 species in Nebraska. And we're having trouble finding some of those and just maybe haven't collected some of those spots in Nebraska. I'm gonna go through briefly the identification. I think this is one of the things when we have a live workshop, we actually practice. So I'll try to speed through these pretty good because it's, it's helpful to, to practice this. And I would encourage you as Katie walks through the segment a little bit to think about how you might go out in the field in the next week or so and start looking for bees and seeing what you see in the environment. Hey Doug, um, can I pause you for yeah, one yeah. second? Yes. Uh, there is a question, um, do you only, I'm sorry, do males have corbicula? Are females the only ones that collect pollen? Was the yes. Question. Yes, females are the only ones that collect pollen. And the corbicula, once you know, it's really easy to see in the large bees, sometimes a little bit harder on the workers that are, can be smaller. But once you see it and know what to look for, you'll, you'll pretty quickly recognize um, the, the bees that have their female and have the corbicula. So yes, good question. Uh, the males are a little bit tougher and Katie, I wish we had a live session today where we could actually find male bumblebees and pick them up. And since the males don't have stingers, you can do that once you know how to look for all the characteristics. I never do that without look, with only looking at one characteristics because you can get pretty easily stung doing it if you don't know what you're doing. So great question. Um, and this, this is a perfect slide for this because again, there are different casts within a bumblebee nest. We have the queen, as Katie explained, they start out the nest at the beginning of the year as a solitary individual. They found the nest, lay the eggs. The first eggs that lay are also female, but the daughters. And they are the workers that then go and bring the pollen and nectar in and help with rearing of the young as the queen does. The queen's mostly an egg laying machine once she gets her daughters, the first brood of daughters out there after about 19, 20 days um, that have emerged from the nest. She doesn't leave again because she's the most valuable individual, I would argue, in the nest. Um, and then the, at the peak of the nest, as the most food is brought in, you know, bumblebees, uh, the nest, as it grows, the peak of the nest, as enough food and pollen is, uh, nectar and pollen is coming into the nest, that's what determines the reproductives, um, the, the next year's queens. Uh, you can take any individual larvae that's in the first instar or two and start feeding it tons of food and it'll grow up to be next year's queens if it's a, if it's a female egg. Um, so those reproductors are produced at the peak of the nest and the males quickly leave and the females leave usually a little bit later. Um, and so they have casts. And so the males, like as Katie said, are pretty much there for reproductive purposes. Um, but anyway, different periods of activity um, in that time span. Right now, you're mostly gonna see queens. In a few weeks, you'll start seeing some of the workers in the earliest emerging bumblebee species. Um, within a particular species, this is a Bombus griseocolis. It's a real common bumblebee throughout Nebraska. You will see variation in individual uh, individuals. You'll see differences in the queens. A lot of the queens have a bar that goes across uh, the first second segment of the abdomen called T2. Others have a brown uh, segment. Some even have a little bit of it almost looks like a little less. Uh, it's just the median or the middle part of that T2 is brown or yellow and the rest is black on the sides. Within workers, there's quite a bit of variation as well. So you can have some variation even within species of coloration. What's fortunate about Nebraska is most of our species are pretty easily distinguished from each other. Uh, there's only a couple species that are really close in appearance in each particular group. Um, important to identifying bees, we've got the head. Um, hair color on the front of the face and top of the head can be different. Top of the head is this part right here. We're taking a top down view of the bumblebee in this particular picture. And the front here is the face. The face is the area between the antennae and the front of the face, okay? As the eyes are kind of looking forward. The top here is our thorax. And it, when you look at these keys, the thorax will have different graphics. The top of the thorax and the side of the thorax can have a little bit different color patterns in the same species. Um, and then finally, I think one of the more important uh, characteristics here is the hair color patterns on the abdomen. The, black, the yellow and black is most appearance for most of our bumblebees in the state of Nebraska. All, all those species have those two colors. We have some a few, three species that have additionally can have orange or red hair color patterns on the abdomen as well. 
once you learn how to identify the different views of the bees from the side and top, it becomes pretty easy to narrow down your identifications to a couple of different species. Again, uh, you can have a, a, no black hair or yellow hair on the top. You can have a little patch, patches of hair is what this represents, the sort of loose hair or balding hair on top of its head. Or you can have bars of different colors in each of these segments, the first part of that, the top of the thorax, middle part, and hind part of that thorax. There are technical scientific names for this, but I won't get into those today um, because I think that can be a little bit more confusing. You can have a stripe of black in here for some of the species if you look at that chart as well. And again, T1, those are turgites, the top of the abdomen, T1 through six in our female species. Males, of course, have an additional segment. Uh, we've grouped this, and Katie has done a lot of refining of this key over the years. Um, they're kind of grouped in similar color, color patterns, which are kind of nice. We have uh, on the left, we have the species that are all kind of have at least T1 yellow and maybe some different colorations. We have our orange tails in the middle there. They have at least orange or red in those middle segments of our species. And then we have sort of that first abdominal segment has black. They're sort of organized in like or similar groups when you get to looking at the abdominal segments of these species. Remember, you are examining the hair color and not the skin or exoskeleton color of the bumblebee. That's what these, these color patterns represent. Okay, we're gonna go through with the species that are very similar. They have the first turgite yellow, all similar grouped together. This is Bombus chrysiocolus. As you can see, we have a ton of records uh, throughout historical records, but also in the, this probably one of our most common species collected in the Nebraska bumblebee atlas time in the last 10, you know, three years and in the last 10 years before. Um, found throughout Nebraska, one of the most common species. Um, it's characterized by having a face and top of its head black hair color. It has the top and the sides of the thorax yellow. Um, T1 and at least part, if not all T2, yellow or brown. One of the most common species, uh, I think the queens probably are out not now or pre getting pretty close to being out if you're looking at for queen bumblebees right now in eastern Nebraska. Um, T's, T3 through six are always all black. Um, this one, they have a buzz cut or shorter hair. Some of our other species have longer, more fuzzy hair. This one is fairly cropped, fairly short compared to some of the other species. And I'll show you a picture of that at the slide here at the very end, some of the different hair um, colors. Another very similar species, and I would argue it's probably one that has advanced the most in the state in terms of range, historical range, and also just abundance is Bombus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee. It's one of those that has really, um, really increased its population, in my experience in collecting the last you know, 20 years. Um, it's th found throughout the two, two thirds of the state. And then where typically, if you go into the east western part of the state, follows sort of the Platte River. And what we found so far, I would not be surprised if it was found in upper northwest Nebraska, up in Sioux County or elsewhere, um, or even all of the state at this point. Um, it is characterized very similar in uh, compared to Bombus griseocolus or previous species. It has yellow hair on top of the head and T1, only T1 in yellow hair, turgite one in yellow hair. So very similar to Bombus griseocolus, uh, other than it's got uh, yellow hair on top of the head and then T1 only is yellow, the rest are black. And so very, very similar to Bombus griseocolus in, in color pattern. You will see a lot of these probably in the eastern part of Nebraska as you look for, for bumblebees. Finally, the other one that's actually, we've got two more, but the other one here that's very similar to Bombus griseocolus is Bombus bimaculatus. Again, a very similar color pattern to both uh, griseocolus and impatiens. It has, does have yellow hair on top of the thorax, or excuse me, top of the head, uh, the vertex of the head, top of the head, and then in the Thorax, mostly yellow hair, but you can have a black spot of hair or kind of balding hair in the middle of this particular species. Much more pronounced if you look at this picture up here than you do in some of uh, the other species we've looked at so far. The big difference here um, from the other two is while T1 is completely yellow, T2 has a sort of W or two marks, it's bimaculatus, two, two um, markings. It almost look like, I don't think like fangs, looks like a W, think of it how you want but two very distinct markings um, compared to griseocolus impatiens and some of the other species. 
once you see a bimaculation, what to look for, most of them look very distinct, especially in the workers um, that are fairly new. And, um, um, and you'll notice it and go, oh, that's really, I, one of my favorite species because it's one you can easily identify and it looks really cool. Uh, pretty amazing if you look at those particular species. It's also found throughout Nebraska in similar spots uh, to Bombus and Patients. And again, it's one of those, I wouldn't be surprised we found it in many more counties once we started looking a little bit more. Uh, and then another similar one, probably the closest looking one I would say to Griseocolis and by Maculatus is Bombus vagans or Boggins. Um, it is found, out, found in East Nebraska and far Northwest Nebraska, uh, probably other places as well. We haven't yet found them, but they do exist. Um, very similar to by Maculatus and the other species we've looked at. T, uh, the top of the head is yellow hairs, Front of the face is black. Again, very similar to the other species, mostly yellow top of the thorax and side of the thorax. Can have some black hairs in the middle. T1 is yellow. T2 is also completely yellow, but kind of comes up in sort of a, well, the hairs are longer on the sides and they kind of have a, a notch in the middle. And if you look at it real closely, you'll see that it, it just almost looks like, I don't like a wave in the middle of that T2 with the black hairs. So, but it's actually those yellow hairs are longer on the sides and come to a point in the middle. So if you look closely, it's not as distinct as a Bombus bimaculatus, who almost looks like just two little dots there that are next to each other. It, it cut, cut carries throughout, but kind of meets a little bit more in the middle. Those hairs are longer on the side of T2. I know in a short amount of time that all is very confusing, but when you get to look at these a little closer, um, you can start telling those two apart. Um, and Katie will talk about how to submit photos in a little bit and how we verify what you have. Bombus fervidus, uh, one of my favorite species found throughout the uh, northern uh, third of two thirds of Nebraska across the state. Again, a lot of these spots that are on the map here have been collected pretty heavily as compared to maybe some of the spots at Sand Hill, so it may be found elsewhere. Uh, one of our first different, this is sort of our, our almost completely yellow thorax group here. And compared to the previous group that we looked at, um, a lot more yellow on, on uh, the abdomen. Again, top of the hair, um, is, head is black, top of the head is black. One special characteristic about this particular group is it has a fairly long face. So if you're to look from the side, it has a little bit longer face than some of the other species and just looks like it's almost like a, almost a more like a horse face a little bit, just a little bit longer. So it's kind of neat to, once you start looking for those other characteristics, you start seeing those things. Top of the thorax uh, is yellow in the, uh, in the front of the thorax, closer to the head has a band of black hair or stripe of black hair in the top of the thorax and the side of the thorax through the middle. Really, really striking. And then again, in the back of the uh, thorax is yellow. So that has that black stripe in the middle. And the cool characteristic of this one, these are usually big and beautiful bumblebees. They have T1 through four all in yellow. And the last five and six, T5 and six in black. Very, very striking bee. If you've seen one, I, I always get excited because it looks so neat. Um, beautiful yellow, that yellow is, that picture is pretty true to its color, just like almost like a maize yellow. Uh, one of my favorite species in the state of Nebraska. Again, found throughout, and they're not, I wouldn't say they're super, super common, um, but they're, you'll, you'll see them out if you get to look in some of these spots. Bombus fraternus, again, a very similar in appearance uh, group. The big difference here between Bombus fervidus is T1 and T2 are uh, yellow. Also has a stripe, also has black hair in the face and top of the, the, the head, black stripe in the thorax, but T3 through, uh, through six are also black hair, has black hair. It's a little bit different. They also have very cropped hair. If you look at this uh, bumblebee compared to some of the others like the, the fervidus before, much more fuzzy, furry, more luscious. Uh, the Bombus fraternus, uh, the Southern Plains bumblebee, has very cropped, cropped hair. Looks quite a bit different. This is one of our species of concern. Uh, so if you find one of these, uh, it's sort of a special treat. They can have gigantic queens. I have one I was gonna bring in that's the si size of a half dollar or bigger. So the queens be quite large. It seems like when I find the workers, the female workers, they're, they're quite a bit smaller. Um, so I, I have some giant queens in my collection um, that was, were collected a number of years ago. Uh, and the workers can be quite smaller. This is one that I've seen quite a bit uh, here in the last few years, 
but I think it's one of those that is contracting in range nationally. So it's good to see that we have so many records found of it here in Nebraska, and I hope that continues it, as you're searching for um, bumblebees this year. Okay, another similar species uh, that we actually haven't found in Nebraska. Um, there is one collection record almost by the South Dakota board that we found, or Katie found on iNaturalist, which is another website where you can submit insect pictures or in other um, plant pictures. But it hasn't really been found by our surveys in over hundred years, is Bombus morrisoni, or, or Morrison's bumblebee. And um, very similar to the next two species we're gonna show in color, it, the, the big difference here is it does have uh, its thorax with yellow hair, but it completely yellow. It's kind of a rusty yellow. I would say it's sort of almost like a almost like an ochre in color. The hair on this particular species, uh, T T one two and part T three in yellow. The middle part of that T three in yellow. This is one that if you find, I'd be super super duper excited uh, because we've been looking for it in in the spots it was collected in Nebraska, which are primarily in the two most western northwestern counties of the state. Hasn't been collected for over 100 years, so I, I'm still thinking it may, may be here, but it hasn't showed up any records around that. So if you're going up the Pine Ridge area, Sioux County, Scotts Bluff area, if you happen to find this, it would be a special treat. It is found in Wyoming and other Western states. And I think it has a pretty abundant uh, you know, population in those other states. Very similar uh, to the Bombus fervidus and Bombus pennsylvanus, which we're gonna see next is the uh, Bombus appositus, the white-shouldered bumblebee. Like our Bombus fervidus and some of our other species, it has that black stripe in the middle. The big distinguishing feature, and if you look at this picture in the upper right-hand side of the screen of a, a, a Bombus appositus, is it's known as the white-shouldered bum bumblebee. It has white or, or buff-colored hairs. You can see the striking difference in the yellow hair in, in compared to its abdomen, compared to its thorax. Has black hair, black stripe hair in the middle, but those yellow, those white shoulders or buff sh uh, color shoulders are very striking. Found in our westernmost counties, Nebraska, it's cool that somebody found one last year. Um, there are a few spots that I found it in, um, and you, you, when you notice it, it just looks different. Those two, those two colored yellow hairs are completely different on, from its thorax and its head to its abdomen. Very striking. Uh, we have another species like this here in Nebraska that has those two colored yellow hair. What you're seeing on this hind leg is a pollen basket. I want to point you out, a lot of these bumblebees can be carrying a lot of pollen back to the nest. So it's a beautiful picture of a pollen basket on a bombus apostus. So that is our, uh, some of our bumblebees in the back. We're gonna go through our uh, red tails or orange tails. We have three bumblebees in Nebraska that can have orange or red tails. The first one and one of my favorite and probably the most abundant one that we found is Bombus huntii or Hunt's bumblebee. It has yellow on the face and top of the head. It has black stripe of hair in the middle of the top of the thorax, the side of the thorax, and yellow the front and back of the top of the thorax. Very striking. I love these three quarter views of, of the bee here. You can see the both the coloration of the top of the thorax and the side. The distinguished characteristic of this particular species is it's got T1 yellow, but T orange, uh, T2 and 3 orange and orange color hair. As a matter of fact, they can be almost red in coloration, almost like my shirt. I found species or, or individuals within that species that can almost be the color of my shirt. T3 is yellow, T5 uh, and 6 are black. Very striking bumblebee. The, the queens can be quite large in size. The workers are typically quite a bit smaller. Uh, we found a lot, so I don't think this is one that's in any sort of threat in Nebraska. As a matter of fact, I think we've sort of extended its range a little bit. Um, Katie found one in the Sandhills. I actually found one uh, when I was a grad student in West Point, Nebraska, a singular queen, and I've been trying to go back to West Point and find that uh, find more of them um, a couple times, and I haven't been able to do so. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they are found uh, along that Elkhorn River corridor across the state as well. So anyway, they're they're beautiful bumblebees. Another one of my favorite here in Nebraska. Similarly, actually, I'm going to go out of order here. Excuse me. Uh, similarly, we have Bombus rufusanctus, and it's very similar to Hunt's bumblebee. However, it has a, a spot of black hair, almost like a circle on the top of the the thorax. Um, T T's two and three are orange, but the top of 
of the front of that T2, top of that T2 is also yellow. So if you look down here, you're gonna see a little bit of yellow hair. I have not seen a black one with T2, three, two and three in Nebraska in our state, but they could be here. Um, but a lot of ours look like this upper left hand, hand picture on the screen. There's a male it looks like in the lower right hand screen. Let's see, that's a female. Uh, no, actually that's a male. The males can be quite varied in color pattern. The females are pretty consistent. Looks look to be fairly consistent in Nebraska with the males. I don't know, I think Rich said they can have 22, 23 patterns. I was talking to someone about that in other states. So they're very varied in, in their coloration. Um, not a super common species. I found that um, when I was a grad student in a few spots in Sioux County, uh, we haven't found it yet in the Atlas. So it'd be one that you could look out for. And it, it has a much lighter orange, almost a yellow orange um, compared to some of the other species like Bombus huntii in the state. Bombus centralis, uh, again, very similar to our other orange tails. The big uh, characteristic on this one is T1 and T2 are yellow, as opposed to T3 being orange uh, in the other species. Uh, it actually has, uh, excuse me, T2 being orange in the other species. T2 is yellow in this species, the Bombus uh, centralis. T3 and 4 is orange. And it also has a stripe of black hair down the middle of its uh, thorax compared to some of the other species. So again, very, very similar species. The big differentiation here is T3 and T4 are orange instead of T2 and T3 in the other species. Finally, uh, the two that are real similar in this state um, to each other are Bombus huntii and then Bombus bifarius, which is this one. Found the far reaches of Western Nebraska. I found this in Sioux County. I believe it's the only spot that I've found in the past. <coughs> excuse me, quite abundant in Western, the US and uh, up into Canada. The, it looks quite a bit different from Bombus huntii in that in its top of its thorax, it actually has a notch uh, in the back part of the, the thorax. Instead of having a yellow bar in the rear part of that top of the thorax, it actually has a break in the hairs and those are actually black hairs there. So I have two patches of yellow hair on the top of the thorax, behind it in the thorax. Um, it can have black hair. We have, I've not seen that in Nebraska, but in a lot of other places it has black T2 and 3. Most of the ones we have in Nebraska have mostly orange hairs on T2 and 3 with a little bit of notch of black hair or bare hair in uh, T3 and 4. So something to keep in mind that this is one that we're kind of looking for that we haven't, I don't think, found. Did we find this uh, last year, Katie, in our surveys the year before? I don't think that's one that we found, right? No, I think the only records of that one in the state are from yours. Okay. All right. So then the last thing to note there, Doug, that that species has actually been split now. So the black color form is called Bombus vancouverensis, um, and it's really okay. a west west coast species. And Bombus bifarius is the one with red on it that that extends out to to Nebraska there. Okay. Good. I'm, gl I'm glad to know that. I didn't know that. That's great. Um, oh, family Vancouver area. Is that right? Uh, really the bulk of the western range, so from the Rocky Mountains basically west all the way to the coast down through California is Vancouverensis. Awesome. Yep. The last group in Nebraska, and I know we're going through this fast and we can spend a lot more time and, and do more hands-on stuff. I wish we, we had you here. One you're going to see a lot of in the state is Bombus oricomus. Bombus oricomus, or the gold ring bumblebee, um, is... A, a quite large bumblebee, both in workers typically and queens especially, they can be pretty good sized bumblebees. They produce large nests, so therefore they bring a lot of resources back to the nest and have workers that are pretty good size. They tend to do pretty well. Um, found throughout Nebraska historically, uh, we've collected some out west and east. My guess is what we'd find it if we went different times in the Sandhills. The blue records are ones that I, I collected during my time or collected before. Um, it can be differentiated from some of the other species in this group. Um, it has a black face, Top of its head is yellow. It has a band of yellow hairs at the fr front part of the thorax, both on the sides and, and the top. And at the very, and mostly black on the top of the thorax with a ring of yellow, the, that's the gold ring of yellow hairs on the back part, top part of that, uh, the thorax. This ring can be even more pronounced where it almost looks like a stripe in some individuals. So I've seen that a much thicker ring as well. If you look at this picture in the upper right-hand side, this is a very prototypical Bombus uh, oricomus with, with some black hairs intermixed with that yellow, and, and but pretty pronounced, okay? Uh, you look at the side here, the side of the thorax and the back 
two thirds is mostly black. T1 is always yellow in this, in this, or excuse me, T1 is always black. T1 is always black in Bombus or Commas. T2 and three is yellow with the remainder of black hairs on the thorax. So gold ring bumblebee, beautiful bumblebee, but uh, uh, you're, one you're gonna see a lot if you start looking throughout the state. Not to confuse you more, is we have Bombus pennsylvanicus, another and perhaps one of the, at one time, one of the most common, uh, the most common bumblebee in the state of Nebraska. When I was a grad student, when I collected bumblebees throughout Nebraska, this 40% of what I collected was Bombus pennsylvanicus. So, uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a decline nationwide in Bombus pennsylvanicus for a few years. Looking at this map, it looks like it has sprung back again and been found throughout Nebraska and recently even, which is great. Um, it's uh, one of those common species that looks super similar to Bombus oricamus. Notice most of the individuals in this particular bumblebee do not have that gold ring on the top part of the back part top of that thorax. So this area uh, right here. The other characteristics you can differentiate it from in the hair color pattern from the previous one, Bombus oricamus, is the back half of T1 is yellow. So not entirely black. The back part of T1 is yellow, whereas Bombus oricamus, that T1 is always, all the hairs are completely black. Looking closely at these segments here and looking at the picture that's up here, that is actually a back part of T1 is yellow, front part is black. And you can see the break in hair, that's the actual uh, inner segment of the ex exoskeleton that's causing that break. What, and so that's what you're seeing there. Uh, Bombus oricamus, T1 is always completely black. So you have to kind of look closely. Those are the, probably the easiest characteristics that, and there's some other things you can, if you look more closely at the morphology um, and got it under a microscope that you could see that are a little bit different. But for the most part, those two are often confused with each other. And even Katie and I sometimes have to debate with each other on what a particular um, ID is on a particular photo. Finally, then we have one that was also very close, Bombus nevidensis. Uh, which is very similar to Bombus oricamus, um, very similar in color pattern to Bombus oricamus and Pennsylvanicus. The big characteristic here that's different is the entire top of the thorax um, is yellow with a few, either a bald spot or a few black hairs in the center, almost like a dot, dot of dark hair on top of Bombus nevidensis. The other characteristic, which maybe isn't as apparent, if we look at the color of the hairs, they're more of a ruddy orange or yellow than they are uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus, very striking in color appearance, or even Bombus oricamus. So going next back to this here, that color of that hair is quite a bit different. It just looks like kind of like a ochre color or maybe even a, a just ruddy yellow. So quite striking when you see it. Also fairly well cropped in hair, hair you know, more cropped the hairs are compared to the other two species we were just looking at. Um, again, similar color pattern to Bombus pennsylvanicus on the abdomen. All right, those are probably the most easily confused, confused with each other, but I do want to point out, uh, and I don't have a lot of time left, I want to get into a couple other things. We do have some of these other species that are, 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 are I almost said Cytherus, these used to be, in, be put in a different group called Cytherus, but these are our cuckoo bumblebees, and the ones that um, do not have their own workers to um, you know, care for their young actually invade other nests and have the queen kill the queen and have the workers of the different queen species raise their young. Um, but uh, again, sparse on the abdomen. These are really wild in coloration compared to the other species. This uh, Bombus centrinus, centrinus is not super common in our state. We have did find one last year, everyone submitted last year, and I, I found, found a couple in the eastern part of the state here. Uh, mostly yellow thorax and then sparse hairs on the abdomen um, with this sort of striped pattern. Uh, on T3 is mostly yellow. So you're gonna see uh, quite a variation. And again, if you do take a photo one, this is one that Katie and I will probably have to jump in. The other characteristic of this one is T3, those yellow hairs are quite long compared to the other hairs on the abdomen and they actually stick out at the top part of T T3 and extend back over the rest of T3. So if you look at this picture here at the screen, it actually looks like these are different types of hairs that are coming out of the abdomen. Very striking compared to uh, the rest of the hairs in the abdomen. Bombus insularis is another species uh, that I think I collected one of uh, when I was a grad student many years ago that we haven't found yet in this project. Um, again, it uh, is found sparsely throughout Nebraska. 
it has shoulders that are yellow. The top of the, the thorax is yellow. Um, and it has just a few yellow hairs on the abdomen. So if you see anything like this, whether it's male or female, this is one of interest for us. I believe the left-hand side, upper left-hand side of this picture is the female. It looks like the male's on the right side, but maybe I'm wrong. I think that's what my guess is on that one. Uh, now, this is not a cuckoo bumblebee, but very similar color patterns to the other. This is Bombus occidentalis. Um, and this is one I, we've only ever found in the two count, up, upper northwest counties of the state, Sioux County and the state that Shadron's in, or the, excuse me, the county that Shadron is in. Uh, we found a few spots out there as well. Uh, this is one of special concern across the nation and in Nebraska hasn't been collected very much, just in a few spots. Um, this is our white-tailed bumblebee. If you find a bumblebee with white hairs on Nebraska, it's probably this species. So if you see this, this is kind of a special one to take note of. For the most part, it mostly has a black abdomen with that white tail and some yellow hairs either in the front or the back, both of that thorax. Um, again, I haven't collected any since 1999 in the state. Um, and so that's one, if you go up in sort of Sioux County, up along the Pine Ridge is where, where I found it and where it has, has been historically found as well. So something to take special note of. The only white tail bumblebee in the state. Males have a little bit more, a lot of males actually, and it has a little bit more buff instead of white tail on the back end. Um, but again, if you see them, these are, these are great ones to, to make sure you get a photo of or even um, collect it for, for reference. So really good. Finally, uh, we have a couple more uh, cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, again, Bomba succulii, it's one that has very few hairs in the abdomen. This upper one in the upper right hand picture um, is one actually, I, I found one in Lincoln, Nebraska, very similar to that. Has very few hairs on the abdomen and, and the ones that do are on the, sort of on the side of the abdomen, very sparse. We don't have a lot of records, three or four ever found in the state, and it's one of special concern um, across the nation. So if you find any cuckoo bumblebee, this one here is a spe of special interest to us as well. Finally, Bombus variabilis, which I've probably collected the most of in the state of Nebraska. Um, I think I've had four or five records of this in my time here. Very similar to Bombus impatiens, or even looks very similar to a carpenter bee. It has an almost completely yellow top of its thorax and very few if any sparse uh, any black hair any yellow hairs on the abdomen and those hairs that are there on the abdomen are mostly black um, and pretty sparse can be confused with the carpenter bee if you're not looking closely because the hairs are so dark and all and looks pretty shiny um, again i'd love for someone to get these and i know that the, um, katie and rich would too get some of these cuckoo bumblebees in nebraska um, because we just have very few records of them, very uncommon. You have to think they're not producing workers in any abundance um, like the rest of, of the other bumblebee species in Nebraska. They don't have that worker class. All right, I'm going to finish up and we'll have a few minutes for questions and we need to get on to the other stuff. I want to point out, um, I took some photos this morning of some of the specimens that I have on record. Um, this is a Bombus fraternus and I wanted to point out how closely those hairs can be cropped and this picture illustrates how it almost looks like a buzz cut on a, a rhombus fraternus. Those hairs are super short and lay back on the abdomen and thorax compared to, these are two different species. We have a rhombus fraternus on the right. And then we have, it looks like we have a bombus, so uh, Pennsylvanicus male on the right. Very, uh, two different hair types, very cropped and very short, very organized in the bombus fraternus on the left. This is a very typical bombus Pennsylvanicus and Bombus Pennsylvanicus male, which you're going to also probably see a lot of in, in our as you're looking here across the state. Disheveled hair in the males, and then also longer hair in most of the other species that are out here. So this gives you, I want to illustrate how the differences can look between different species and the hair type, besides the color patterns. What happens to specimens over time, these are 20-year-old specimens that I collected as a master student many years ago. And uh, they darken over time. The, the, they're not as beautiful as when you first find them. Um, so they can darken over time. So those references, live pictures are the best, you know, if that someone's taken of a bee on flower are better than even reference collections after a period of time because these become darker. Um, again, I, this picture illustrates another difference I wanted to show you. Male on the right, female on the left. The big distinguishing characteristic that just I can point out here besides that one's male and female um, is the length of antennae. We have one additional segment on the male on the right. The left is a female. They're not the same species, but it doesn't matter here. 
I just wanted to illustrate the difference in length of antennae. Male on the right is a little bit longer. Females are always a little bit shorter antennae. That's the difference. So again, you want to look at the other characteristics. It's, it's subtle, but once you get to looking for this and knowing what to look for, it's a lot easier to differentiate things like male to female. Okay, coloration. There are a difference between species and different color patterns. And I wanted to put this picture up here again, a photo I took this morning, not a great photo. Took it with my phone outside. On the right um, is a very more ruddy colored bumblebee. In the center, that's more lemon. That's our Bombus uh, griseocolis queen that I collected many years ago. Um, they have a typically a lighter, more lemon yellow color, more vibrant color, which species on the right does not. Um, and then again, on the left is our Bombus oricomus. It has a little bit darker, more ruddy yellow little shorter hair than our Bombus griseocolis female in the front. So these are pictures of real specimens just to show you that their colors are still different over time, but that one in the middle, if we had more light on it, would be much more lemon yellow color. So there are difference, differences between species. Um, that's what I have. I'm sorry I went a little bit long, Katie. Um, this is always a talk that I struggle with because I could spend all day going into individual species um, and I, I could talk forever, I'd probably talk too much about individual things, but um, Let's go through some questions. We have a few minutes if, uh, in particular that folks might have, especially questions that are um, meaningful, I guess. <laughs> yes, um, Belinda asked, does there tend to be more yellow on the males? That's a great question. Yes, um, uh, there is in more general across most species, but you do have species like Bombus fraternus that the exact same color pattern in male and female. So that isn't a characteristic um, that you can solely rely on, but in some species they do have, and they almost always have, and most species have very wild hair. It's like they woke up in the morning and didn't brush the hair. All right, and then the other question is, can you describe how to tell the two pairs of wing apart? In a lot of the photos, it looks like there are just two wings. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I had a, I wish I put, put up a drawing or had something to draw here. But yeah, the, the front, the forewing, the very front wing, the one closest to head is much longer and really uh, elongated. And the back wing is uh, much, it's about half the size and a triangular shape. And they a lot of times are paired together. So I don't know, I wish I, maybe I can, I, I don't want to show my messy bedroom, uh, but I could draw a picture and show you probably a lot easier. Um, and I may just, I don't know, it's, it's hard to see because they're a lot, a lot of times attached in those photos and usually behind the bee, right? They don't put them straight out. You'll see them on pinned specimens and they never look quite right because they, a lot of people want to pin them like a bumblebee, like a butterfly to show the wings. And they almost always have them behind their back when you're phot phot photographing them or, or have them pinned. And then Aaron said that the county that you're looking for for Occidentalis is Dawes County. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't think of it at the time. I had, I had a brain. I guess I did know Dawes County. I was, I just, sorry. You know, when you do these presentations, I want to cover so many things. I, I always screw the first and second tour guide. So you probably heard that a few times. So I'm trying to overthink things. So I, I realized I couldn't remember that name at the time. So there you go. It's Dawes and, and the other. There it is. Two. All right. Any other questions about species in the state? Okay, well, it looks like we're good. Thanks for going over that, Doug. Lots of favorite bumblebees. Yeah, they're pretty much all the favorite. I priced the five. No, I don't have a non favorite, so it's. it's I, I will say one, some of them are very <laughs> striking, and that's one of these things that yeah. I wish we'd be out like peak time of the year where we could see, collect five or six because those words are so true. You'll find one and you'll just be like fervid and some of these others that are so big and beautiful. Um, it's going to catch you, and you're going to know exactly if you remember back to this talk. Yeah. what we're talking about so i wish we could do that today yeah it is a lot more fun in person um okay well the last part we're gonna try and go through here real quick is the participation um so how you sign up how you conduct a survey how you submit your data how you photograph so let me get my screen shared Okay, how's that look? Looks good. Looks good? Okay. So this, this is just a basic overview of what we're gonna talk about here in the next couple of slides. So the first thing when you're gonna sign up 
is you're going to set up your Bumblebee Watch account. You need to do that before you can adopt a grid sale because you need your username to enter into your sign up form. And then once you have that, you're basically signing up to say, I'm going to run at least two Bumblebees, Bumblebee surveys in my grid sale between June and September. So there's a lot of flexibility for you to choose where you're going to run your surveys, uh, what time you're going to run your surveys, and pick out your own locations. You can run more than two surveys, but the minimum that we ask you to do is two. And when you go out to conduct a survey, you're going to start with a bumblebee survey, and there's a couple different types you can run, and then you're going to follow that with a habitat assessment. Um, and then once you've photographed your bees during the survey, you filled out your data sheets, you're going to submit everything online. So everything that I'm about to go over now is in the handbook that you can find online. So don't worry about remembering everything. It's all written down. There's step-by-step -step instructions. Um, it's, all, it's all there for you. So for setting up your Bumblebee Watch account, you just go to bumblebeewatch.org. And in the top corner, you click the sign in slash sign up button. And when you sign up for this account, um, it's gonna create a profile. So you figure out your username that you want. And as you log species, right, as you submit data, it keeps track of them for you. So here you can see that I've collected oricomis, bimaculatus, fraternus. So it's kind of fun to go back and check and see what species you've seen. Um, the important thing that you're going to need here is to record your username and the email address because you're going to need to sign into this account again, but you also need your Bumblebee Watch username to adopt your grid cell. So then you head over to the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas website and click adopt a grid cell. And these grid cells are split up again by our priority zone. So we're really focusing on central and western Nebraska because they've been under surveyed when we look at how many surveys have taken place across the state, right? We had a lot of people surveying in eastern Nebraska the past two seasons. So this year we really want to expand west and look for some of those bumblebees that we haven't detected yet. Um, you don't have to live out there to go survey. We do have many volunteers that live in the Lincoln Omaha area, but they vacation out at um, Lake McConaughey or they're going up to Toadstool. If you're going on vacation to Colorado or something, um, you can select a grid cell that's along the route there um, if you feel safe doing so, of course. Uh, okay. So the two types of bumblebee surveys are point surveys and roadside surveys. Uh, regardless of which bumblebee survey you do, you're going to carry out a habitat assessment. And then the last thing we're going to talk about are incidental observations, which are not a formal survey, but is still a way that you can submit a bumblebee observation. So a point survey is the preferred type of survey. It's when you select an area that's one hectare or about two and a half acres anywhere within your grid cell that you want to survey. It can be on your own land, it can be on public land somewhere. You select that area and you're going to run a bumblebee survey for 45 person minutes. And person minutes is kind of a weird term here, but it the time is split up by the number of people you have actively searching for bumblebees. So if you have three people out looking for bumblebees, you only have to do a 15 minute survey, right? Because there's three people 15 minutes, that's 45 minutes in total. Um, your completion of a point survey includes one bumblebee survey and one habitat assessment. Compared to a roadside survey, which is when you select a 10 mile stretch of road, and we realize that these are sometimes easier to carry out in Nebraska because there's a lot of private land, but there are many roadsides that are public access. So sometimes these roadside surveys can be a little bit easier to plan. And along your 10 mile stretch of road, you're going to do five mini surveys. So each time you stop along your stretch of road, you're going to do a 15 minute survey. And your surveys have to be at least a half a mile apart, but it's up to you where you stop. So you might find a place that has a lot of blooming flowers. You can pull over, see if there's bee activity. If not, you can get back in and drive a little bit further. At each stop, you're going to do one bumblebee survey 
and one habitat assessment. So at the end of these surveys, when you go to submit to Bumblebee Watch, you're gonna have five surveys and five habitat assessments. So you'll be submitting five different times to the website. And make sure that when you are doing roadside surveys that you wear bright colors or a safety vest to remain visible to oncoming traffic. So after you've done your bumblebee survey is when the habitat assessment occurs. And these are not meant to be exhaustive surveys. They should take five to 20 minutes. It depends on your location. If you have a lot of blooming plants, it might take a little bit longer. Um, same thing if you're not really familiar with the types of plants, it might take a little bit longer. But you're basically asked to assess the habitat around you. What kind of habitat are you in? What does the area around you look like? Um, how many plant species are there? And we're going to look at the data sheet together um, in a second. And then the last thing we want to talk about are incidental observations here. So these are not uh, included as one of your two surveys that you have to complete. But this is a way for you to submit an observation that's not part of a survey. So like when you're walking your dog or you're just sitting out at your house and you see a bumblebee, you can take a picture of it and upload it. And that still is valuable information. Um, it's just not part of a survey because there's no habitat assessment attached to this one. So the first step in conducting your survey is to plan your survey. You wanna take some time to figure out where you're going, about the time it's gonna take. You wanna look at the weather. You wanna make sure you have all your supplies before you get out to the survey site. Um, steps two and three of collecting data and photographing are largely going to be covered in a video that Rich and I put together last year, right? Usually we teach this part in the field and we show you how to swing nets and how to handle bees up close, but with the given times, we can't do that safely, obviously. So we've tried our best to convey some of these tactics in a video for you. Um, and then after the video, I'll show you how to use the website to upload data. So for planning when to survey, again, there's a lot of flexibility here. You can choose any day between June and September. You can do your two surveys on the same day in different locations, or you can do your surveys on different days at the same location. So it's really up to you how you wanna carry out the surveys. Um, for choosing the day, you wanna make sure that the weather is between 60 and 90 degrees, uh, and the winds are less than 15 miles an hour, and that it's not raining, right? Those conditions make it a nice space for bees to be out foraging. And then again, the time that we've chosen here between June and September is the peak active season for bumblebees in Nebraska. So when we're most likely to see workers out foraging. And then when you're looking for a place to survey, um, a good place to start, we've made a, a Google map that overlays all of the grid cells. So once you have your grid cell, you can sort of zoom in using Google satellite imagery. Um, just look for green areas or natural areas that are open to the public that you can go survey on. So this could include forest service land, um, parks in your area. You can go to different urban areas, roadsides, um, but make sure wherever you're going that you have permission to be there um, if you're planning to do like game and parks, you need a permit to survey on those lands. Um, so just make sure that you're surveying in a place that you're allowed to. When you're going out into the field, some things that are good to bring with you, obviously you need your data sheets and something to write with. Um, you're gonna need some sort of vial to hold your insects in. We have a list of all of these things on page 27 in the handbook that tells you um, a search term if you want to buy some vials, but you can also repurpose a lot of vials. A lot of us have pl plastics or glass. Um, many times you can use those as insect jars. Um, crushed ice in a cooler because you're going to be catching bees and chilling them on ice. And then you're going to need something to photograph your bees with. 
A smartphone works um, preferably a digital camera that has a macro setting on it. It takes much higher quality photos, um, but it is not required. Um, something to record your location. So when you're out in the field and you're writing down the data that you need, you're gonna need to record your coordinates. Um, you're going to need a timer to make sure that you're staying on track with your 45 minutes. You're gonna need something to look at the weather. So there's a lot of handy apps that you can use right on your phone to get some wind speeds and temperatures. Um, and then field guides. Field guides are very handy, especially if you're not very familiar with the vegetation. These field guides can help you figure out what plants you're looking at. You can bring the bumblebee field guide out there. Um, and then photographing. I'm just gonna briefly touch on this because it is covered in the video. But when you're photographing, you wanna make sure that your photo gets the hairs on the top of the face um, and on the front. We need to be able to see what colors are on the top and the front of the face. Your photo should also include um, a clear image of the thorax, whether that's top down or from the side but we need to be able to see the colors as well as if there's any patterns. Is there a spot on the thorax? Is there a stripe between the wings? And then we need to be able to see all the different um, abdominal segments. So what color is each of the tergites? Again, you can do this using multiple photos. You can submit up to five photos. Um, and there are some like these photos are not identifiable if they're submitted. Um, this one right here looks like a good photo, but if somebody submitted that, we wouldn't be able to verify a species. We can see it's a bumblebee, but without seeing the rest of the abdomen, it's hard for us to say from a photo what bee that is. Same with this one. It's a little bit dark, which can be fixed on a computer, but it's too blurry. We can't see the abdomen we're not gonna be able to tell what species that is. And this one, we can see it's a bumblebee, but without seeing the patterns on the abdomen, that could be a couple of different species, right? And same with this one, might be a bumblebee, but it's too dark. We can't see what's under the wings. We don't know what color the hairs are on the face. So when you're in the field, just check to make sure that your photos match up with what is needed for identification. And um, when we're talking about the wings, that question was asked, when you're handling bees and they're chilled, they're quite um, malleable, you can manipulate them. And so sometimes their wings will be stiff against their back and you can simply use your finger and sort of push those wings up to get a photo of the abdomen like this person is doing here. And when you do that, you'll clearly see that there are two wings there because one of them is gonna to wanna to go easily and the other one is gonna flop back every single time. So I think once you're in the field, you will be able to clearly see that there are two wings there. And two species that we wanna go over that you really need good photos of are our lookalike species. And Doug kind of touched on this, um, but the American bumblebee and, let me get rid of this pointer here. The American bumblebee and the black and gold bumblebee. To tell these apart, we need to be able to see the hairs on the color of the head. So the black and gold bumblebee has yellow hairs on top of the head and the American bumblebee has black hairs. And then that, um, the half black and half yellow T1 that Doug also mentioned is a very good characteristic in Nebraska. The American bumblebee has this half and half, whereas black and gold can be black, the males can have yellow. Um, so make sure you're getting these two features in your photos if you think you have one of these bees. And then the next one is the males of Bombus pensylvanicus, the American bumblebee, and Fervidus, the yellow bumblebee. And somebody was asking about more yellow on males, and that is the case in the American bumblebee. You can see that this bee here, the American bumblebee male, has a lot of yellow on it, and it looks very similar to the yellow bumblebee. 
So for these photos, we need to be able to see the face. We need to be able to see the thorax. The thorax in male American bumblebees have mixed hairs, right? They have black and yellow mixed in on their thorax. Whereas the yellow bumblebee has strict divisions between where the black band is and where the yellow hairs are. And then lastly, we need to be able to see that last tergite on the abdomen. Oftentimes um, males in the American bumblebee will have a little tiny patch of orange. Sometimes it can be a pretty easily seen patch of orange, but sometimes it's only a few hairs like this. So make sure that you get the last segment of the abdomen, some clear photos of the thorax and the face so that we can discern this bee or Doug and I can at least try to fight over which species it is. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm going to play a video. Hi, my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerces Society and I'm here to teach you how to do a survey for the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas or the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. They both have pretty much the same survey protocols. Um, so I'm here today, I'm in a beautiful natural area. It's a nice, warm, sunny day. Um, I've got my net and I have some vials in my pocket, so I'm pretty much ready to do a survey. Um, the first thing you wanna do is make sure that the site is big enough. It needs to be about a hectare. Um, and a hectare is about the size of a football field, lengthwise, square. So sort of a football long and the same distance wide. It's 100 square meters. So a football field, including the end zones. Another way to think about it is the infield of a track. If you ever ran track, the entire infield on the inside of a, of a running track is about a hectare, or a soccer field is also about a hectare. Um, so you wanna make sure it's big enough. And then usually what I do once it's, I decide that it's a big enough site is I walk around and, and I make sure that there's enough flowering resources. You wanna make sure that there is something that bees could be visiting. Otherwise, um, it's probably not worth really conducting a survey or maybe come back at a later date when there are flowers. One of the things you wanna do when you're out pre-walking your site is make sure you're keeping an eye out for inconspicuous flowers. Sometimes flowers will grow down amongst the grass, but they can be important for bumblebees and often are. This plant is called self-heal and often grows underneath the understory or overstory of grass and is a great bumblebee plant. Another important thing when we're out looking for bumblebees is we wanna make sure we're looking at all blooming plants. If I was standing here looking in this patch, I might be drawn to the violets, to the dandelions, or maybe to the bluebells over here. But in reality, one of the most attractive plants in this patch has green inconspicuous flowers, but bumblebees love it. This is a plant called water leaf, and the flowers aren't quite open yet because it's still very early in the season here. But these little green guys here are gonna bloom into little beautiful little flowers that hang down sort of under the understory, and they often can't be seen. But bumblebees like Bombus flavifrons and other long tongue species really love these flowers and will visit them. So while you may not be drawn to them with your own eyes, it's really important to pay attention to what's blooming and making sure that we're spending time looking at all the flowering resources on the landscape, looking for different species of bumblebees. Other things you may want to look for as you're doing a pre-walk around your site are things that may be a potential hazard. You may want to avoid plants like poison oak or blackberry Although it is notable that both of these plants do flower and can be attractive to bumblebees. You'll also want to look out for holes or other things to avoid like electric lines, fences, barbed wire. Just make sure you're safe while you're doing your survey. You also want to keep an eye out for property lines to make sure you're not crossing from public land onto private land. And also keep an eye out for areas that you may want to spend a couple more minutes, areas with high quality forage that you know are especially attractive to bumblebees, or keep an eye out for blooming trees, meaning don't forget to look up. There are sometimes flowers that are above your head that can also be attractive to bumblebees. Once you've finished your pre-walk, you're ready to start your survey. 
Materials that you want to make sure that you have with you before you begin your survey are an insect net, jars to place your bumblebees, a cooler with crushed ice, make sure you have a timer, and then for processing your bees, you'll need your data sheets as well as a camera. We recommend having a dedicated camera, ideally with a macro function, but in a pinch, a smartphone can work as long as you learn how to control your white balance and take high quality photos with it. I typically set up a station in the middle uh, of my survey area, um, which has the cooler and the area where I'll process the bees later. Um, and then I, I grab a handful of, of vials and, and head out to go conduct my survey. Um, and when you're conducting your survey, you want to make sure it's 45 minutes long. Um, and that's 45 person minutes. So if you're doing it with a friend, you would do it for 22 and a half minutes. Um, and if you did it with two other friends, it would be for 15 minutes. Um, you just want to have 45 total minutes of search time. Um, the important thing also is that when you're doing a survey, you want to pause the timer while you catch a bee. So it's 45 minutes of searching, not 45 total minutes. So you want to pause the timer um, when, you, when you catch a bee and while you're putting that bee into a vial and while you're putting that vial into the cooler. That doesn't count for your search time. The other thing that's important while you're doing your survey is you want to make sure that you're associating every bee observation that you have with a flower. Um, so one of the important things about the Atlas project is we want to learn what resources that bees are using. So while you're out collecting bees off of flowers, you want to make sure to record that information so that we can gather it later and use that information when we um, analyze the data from the project. So with each bee that you capture, you want to also record the flower on which you captured it. Catching a bumblebee in a net is not an easy task. It takes a lot of practice. So one of the things that we recommend is that you spend some time practicing in your backyard before you go out and actually conduct your survey. That way you'll get some competency and some confidence so that when you see a bumblebee during your survey, you'll actually be able to net it. There are really two different ways to go after a bumblebee on a flower. One way is to just swing your net and try to catch it in there like this. The important thing is after you've swung, you want to make sure to turn your net over to close the bottom of it so that the bee doesn't come flying right out into your face. There's a number of ways to do that. I like to do a little flip, but the easiest way to do it is to swing and then just turn the net over one, two times. And then you'll have the, the bee in this section of the net that's laying over the top. The other way to go after a bee instead of sweeping is to just go over the top and drop the net on the bee like that. That way the bee will be trapped in the net. The next step then would be to grab the bottom of the net and pull it up to the top and the bee will fly right to the top of the net because it's attracted to the sun. Let's see if we can find some bees to practice on. Sometimes you just have to go and follow for her a bit. She looks like she's looking for a nest, so they can be really hard to track. But we can just throw the net over the top of them like that sometimes while they're flying. And I got her. I can see her moving in the net there. So what I do is I pull the net then up to the top and make sure she's under there. I see her right in there, and then I can put her in the vial. Okay, so now that I have a bee in the net, what I need to do is get the bee from a net into the vial. And the way I'm going to do that, um, she's somewhere in this folded over area. I can see her crawling around right here. And so what I want to do is make sure she gets all the way down to the bottom of the net. So what I can do is I can just take the net and just go back and forth a couple of times and then fold it over. And then I like to grab it when I know she's above my hand here. 
so I know that she's between my hand and the bottom of the net. And then I can take my jar, take the top off, but I wanna keep that cap close by. And so then what I do is I stick the, the jar into the net and it goes through my hand here, okay? So that there's no way for the bee to get out. And then what I can do is just sort of move the net around until I'm sure that I have the bee in the net. And unfortunately, my net is very dirty, so it's hard for me to see. But I can hear her. I know she's in there. And usually you'll hear that sound when you know she's in your jar. I know that she's in the jar. And now I can just use the net basically as the top of my jar. So I'm just gonna reach my hand in and again, I'm gonna grab that plastic vial and I'm just pulling the top of the net over the top of the jar so the net is still serving as the top until I get to the edge and then I'm just gonna slide it directly into and put the cap directly on and then I can close the top and I can see the bee there in the jar. And that is how you transfer, or at least one method for transferring a bee from a net into a jar. Okay, so now I wanna show you another method for getting a bee from a net into a vial. Um, you can see the bees crawling around in the vial right here. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, in the net right there. And I wanna get her into the vial. Um, so one thing is a good thing to do. Some people just aren't comfortable holding the net while they do this, so they like to put it on the ground. But you can see if I hold the net straight up, the bee will fly all the way to the top of the net, okay? And then I can move forward. So some people just like to set it on the ground and then use the ground sort of as the cap and then stick the vial into the net. And then again, same principle. You can pin the bee against the net as the top and then you can stick your other hand in there and just put the cap on and then you'll have the bee in the jar. Simple as that. And then what we want to do is we want to take the bee once it's in a vial and we're going to put it into the ice pack. And it's ideal to stick it as far into the ice as we can so that the ice is completely surrounding the bee and then it'll chill very quickly so that we can take the photographs that we need to take. Normally, one of the things that I would do in this situation is I would take the flower that I captured this bee on and I would put it into the jar so that later when I was processing my bees, I could know which flower that I caught this bee on. And keeping that, um, keeping track of that is very important for the data we're collecting for the Atlas project. Or in this case, because this bee wasn't visiting a flower, it was just flying around, it's not going to have any floral association. So if I don't put a flower in there, then I'll know that when I process my data later. But if I'd captured this bee on, say, a dandelion, I could come over to a dandelion flower and just grab the flower off and pretty easily just tuck the flower into the jar with the bee. And then later when I process this bee, I'd have the flower and the bee in the same jar so that I can keep track of it. Other people like to take notes and have a notebook and they will number their vial and say this would be B number one. They could go B number one and they would write down the flower or take a picture of the bee next to the flower. There's lots of different ways to keep track of it. We don't care which way you do it. We just care that you do do it. So when I finish my survey, I like to get a station set up to take my photographs. Um, I wanna make sure that I have everything I, I have and everything I need um, before I get started because when I take the bees out of the cooler, they're gonna start warming up and I wanna make sure that I have everything. So I wanna make sure that I have my data sheet and a pencil that has lead in it. So I wanna make sure I can take my notes. Um, and I wanna make sure that I have my camera. Um, the other thing I like to do is make sure that my camera is set so the pictures I'm going to take 
are appropriate for the lighting conditions. So I usually will take, take a cap of a vial or something like that and make sure that I have my camera um, in the right settings. Um, before I get started so I don't have to wait while the bee is warming up. So I get it um, in my macro setting and make sure that the pictures that I take look good. So here I am, I'm going to take a picture and that looks pretty good. Um, you can see here that it looks pretty good. I could probably add a little bit of light. It's a little bit dark so I may change the white balance a little bit but for the most part it looks pretty good. Um, so once I'm ready and I've got um, I've got the information that I need, I can start processing my bees. Um, but first I want to make sure I've filled out the top of my data sheet. Um, so I have my site name and my grid cell ID in here along with the date and the survey method, my weather information, and the surveyors and the survey time. All of that's entered in on the data sheet and I can get ready to enter the bees. Now each line on your data sheet here is going to represent a vial. So each bee that you captured gets its own line. So you're going to enter what bumblebee species that you think it is, its host plant, and then the photo numbers that you need, um, that you took of that bee. Um, I'm going to move and process my bees in the direct sunlight here um, because it, it often will take a different picture or a better picture if you have direct sunlight. Um, sometimes it's too bright, you just have to take a look at the pictures um, that come out of your camera and adjust your settings and your location appropriately. And I can't stress this enough, I get way too many photos um, that people took that are out of focus or are too bright or are too dark. And if someone goes through all of this trouble of collecting bees, puts bees in jars and bees in the jars in a cooler and then takes pictures that doesn't allow me to identify them. A lot of that effort has been wasted. So taking pictures is really the most important thing um, that you can do. And I want you to make sure to get your settings right and take the time you need to get the best pictures that you can. So I'm ready. My station's all set up. I have everything I need. I can grab my first bee out of the cooler. And once you take a bee out of the cooler, you'll know she's ready to be processed if you can kind of shake the bar, the, the jar back and forth, and she moves pretty freely in there. That's when you know she's ready to be processed. And so usually what I do is I'll just dump her out onto some surface, and if you have white, that's great. It works really well. Um, other colors can work too. Um, darker colors, just something that's flat and neutral usually helps pretty well. Um, so one of the things that we can do when we look at our bee, you remember there's a lot of pic different pic photos that I need. I need to be able to see the picture of the face. I need to be able to see a picture of the thorax. And I need to be able to picture, see a picture of the abdomen, including all of the segments back there. Um, and for yellow-faced, yellow-striped bees, I need to be... I need to see a picture of the underside of the abdomen. That, that allows me to tell the differences between some very close look-alike species. So when they're completely out is a great time to take a picture of that underside of the abdomen if you have that species. And in this case, I do. So I want to get really close if you can. And this is why a camera with a macro setting um, is really the best option. You want to get as close as you can and you want to take a nice picture of the underside of the abdomen. Okay, so now I can see the color of those hairs on the abdomen, which is exactly what I need to see. Also, when she's in this position, I can often take a very good picture of the face. And it's nice to take a nice close-up like this, because then I can see the cheek length, as well as the color of the hairs on her face, and the colors of the hair on the top of her head. I also like to include a profile shot, like this. Okay, and one of the nice things about a shot like this is I can see the hairs on the face, on the thorax, and on the abdomen. And now I want to be able to make sure that I can see every single segment on that abdomen and then the color patterns there. So you want to sometimes peel those wings apart and make sure you get a nice clear shot. It's okay if your hand is in there, 
but we really just want to be able to see all of the segments back there on the abdomen. Okay, so I had to stop that short. We're running close on time here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen once more. I'm going to show you the habitat assessment really quickly. And so when you look at the top of your bumblebee data sheet, when you start your habitat assessment after you've processed all your bumblebees, you're gonna connect it so that it's the same on your habitat sheet. So the same site name, the same date, and the same survey. That way, when you go home later to upload your data, you know which bumblebee survey connects with which habitat assessment. The first part of the habitat assessment is um, looking at your survey area. So here you're gonna check the dominant survey type. Are you in a grassland? Are you in a wetland area? Are you in a woodland? Um, there's some examples of what the different types can be represented as. And you're just gonna select one of those. Then you can select the top three most dominant surrounding types. So what kind of habitat is around you? Um, do you see crop fields adjacent to you? Do you see a riparian area, which is like a, um, a wooded bank along a stream or a creek? Do you see a wetland? Just mark the top three that are around you. If there's only one or two, you can leave the other ones blank. So you only need to fill out one of the most abundant surrounding types, but you can fill out up to three. After assessing the habitat types, you're gonna state how much of the area has flowering resources. So you're gonna select somewhere between 10 and more than 90%. And it doesn't have to be like every single part of your survey area is flowering. So in the top here, we have examples of what 0% might look like with little to no flowering resources compared to a field that is blooming quite um, abundantly. So you're just gonna circle there how many resources are in bloom. And then you're gonna look around for nest features. So these boxes are things that we associate with bumblebee nests. So you're gonna look around and see if you see bunch grasses, if you see brush piles, if you see mulch or spots of loose bare soil and make sure you're looking all around your survey area, right? If you had a whole football size field, make sure that you're assessing everything there. And then you're gonna take a look at management practices that might be happening in your area. So you're gonna circle yes, no, or suspect for each one of these practices. Do you see mowing happening? Do you see domestic grazing? Or do you think there's native grazing? You can look around for animal prints. You can look around for scat. Um, do you see honeybees? And then you can take notes um, if there's something that you want to write down for each of these. Then you're gonna flip the page over and you're gonna start looking at the blooming plant. So first you're gonna say how many different species are in bloom in your survey area. And then you're going to write down those species to the best of your ability. You can write down the common name, you can write down the um, scientific name. If you don't know the plant and you don't wanna identify it in the field, we suggest taking pictures of it and um, looking it up later online or using a guidebook when you have more time to sit down. 